All right, I am now joined uh, by Professor of Economics, uh, Zero Books author, you can see a couple of his books behind him, uh, House Economist at Current Affairs Magazine, uh, the one and only Rob Larson, uh, here to continue our Sunday night uh, debate breakdown series where we watch and comment on old debates that are available on YouTube. Uh, so uh, this week uh, is uh, going to be William F. Buckley uh, versus Michael Harrington on Firing Line, arguing about the war on poverty. Uh, back, you know, back when people still at least actually talked about a war on poverty. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, I should say, by the way, uh, that I was originally um, going to be joined by our friend and comrade Bhaskar Sankara, but uh, he is with family uh, over the holiday, and uh, and the internet connection is extremely bad uh, where where he is. So he he is going to be back in a few weeks. But I'm uh, very delighted that you uh, that you filled in, Rob. Looking forward to this. Thanks, man. Yeah, my pleasure. I'm happy to uh, join in the Argument Science Theater 3000 format here. This sounds fun. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, yeah. So let's see. Let's let's uh, let's let's try to set this up a, a little bit. Uh, by the way, I think everything should uh, should go smoothly. But but I should tell people that uh, we're trying something a l just very slightly different tonight because when the uh, show comes back for real uh, after, which is going to be a week from tomorrow, tomorrow with the regular time when new episodes normally premiere, uh, the um, the uh, Sopranos recap uh, bonus episode uh, for this month, which I recorded a couple weeks ago and it's been available for patrons. It's going to premiere on the YouTube channel the, uh, the time that it would normally... Um, that uh, new episodes would normally premiere 7.30 uh, p.m. on Monday, uh, Eastern Standard. And then uh, in week, on the first Monday of January, we're going to start up on the new format, uh, which is to say it's the show is going to be the same time it's always been, uh, but instead of being recorded over the weekend and then premiered on Monday night, it is going to be live on Monday night. Uh, and our uh, producer, uh, Forrest Miller, who, who people have seen, in uh, the uh, the various movie live streams that we've done, uh, is going to have a little bit more of an on air role, kind of analogous to uh, to Matt Leck uh, on uh, TMBS uh, or uh, or Kale uh, Brooks on uh, Jacobin's weekend shows, uh, and so we're kind of taking tonight as a little bit of a test run uh, for uh, for for what that would be like. So uh, so every once in a while you might hear me say like you know let's stop or something like that. And that's, that's um, so, so those are just uh, directions to, uh, to Forrest. And then, uh, and then also because he's here to, to keep track, don't have to worry about missing them as they, as they whiz by. Uh, if there are super chat questions, uh, Forrest will just, will just read those for us at the end. Uh, and we can address those at the end. But, uh, but as far as the, uh, as the uh, debate itself, what should we say about this to set this up? So, um, so Michael Harrington, um, let's see, you're a uh, you're a DSA member, right, Rob? Indeed. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, I'm pretty sure I've seen you with the uh, the the rose uh, pin uh, on yeah, your exactly. uh, lapel pin on your jacket, uh, and so. That's uh, Michael Harrington uh, was the main founder of something called the Democratic Socialist Organizing Committee, uh, which uh, later joined forces with uh, the New American Movement, which was kind of an offshoot of, of SDS. Uh, Barbara Ehrenreich, you know, was one of the big leaders of, of that uh, NAM, and the two combined to form what's now uh, DSA. So, um, uh oh. Um, See so a couple of worrying comments in chat. Can uh, if people if the audio is okay, if people can hear us, could you uh, could could people reassure me of that in the chat to, to make sure? You Coming know? through clear. Yeah. Yes. Testing. Testing. Let's see. Okay. Okay. Very good. All right. So. Um, all right. Awesome. I uh, just uh, just wanted to I just wanted to check that I I saw a comment that made me worried, but that might have been from from earlier on. Uh, so yeah, um, outstanding. So yeah, uh, great. So so okay. So Harrington, we can to short you know to shorthand that history a little bit. 
Um, you know, it's we can say the first approximation uh, was the uh, the founder of Democratic Socialists of America (DSA) uh, and um, William F. Buckley, of course, uh, was uh, the founder of the National Review, which uh, which is what uh, you know, which which is sort of the um, the face of conservatism that has intellectual pretensions. Maybe let's put it that way. <laughs> yeah. And uh, yeah, play that big evil orchestrating role, bringing the modern right together with your, so that trad wives and Elon Musk, Peter Thiel types can cohabitate in one party for pure evil. Uh, without the work of Buckley and all those guys before him, Mitch McConnell wouldn't be, uh, dictating policy today. So a long shadow. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's right. That's right. Um, I actually read, uh, Buckley's, uh, first book, uh, this last, yeah, it was this last year, you know, try to, uh, force feed myself a conservative book or two a year to, you know, to, to, so I, you know, can, um, have some sort of, so sort of sense of, uh, of what they think. And so one of the ones that I read in the last year was, uh, God and man at Yale, uh, by William F. Buckley, which is a, which is an interesting one, uh, which, cause it's sort of the, I think it's one of, as far as I can tell, I mean, I don't know, maybe there was a thriving genre I don't know about, but as far as I can tell, it's, it's like kind of the first of this series of books about how crazy and horrible and leftist, uh, college campuses have become. Uh, but it's, it's very unlike a lot of that this later stuff that came in that genre uh, because Buckley isn't, um, isn't arguing uh, that um, like he isn't arguing that the free speech of conservatives is being suppressed. All that came much later. Right. In fact, he's kind of arguing the opposite. Like he's, he's explicitly saying that the colleges should be, you know, firing these professors who, who have uh, terrible leftist views uh, who are uh, who are atheists or socialists or you know things you know things like that. So yeah, it, yeah. Buckley was very against that secular culture, and he wanted to you could say cancel that culture. I mean, that would be one way to put it. No, I, I mean no for for sure. I mean he he did yeah he was uh, I mean he was definitely <laughs> he was definitely advocating uh, you know yeah I mean deplatforming uh, the uh, the left yes. uh, you know very explicitly and yeah he's also. I mean, in that book, he makes a big legalistic deal saying, okay, like Yale's a private organization, so there's no, you know, constitutional issue here. Uh, but elsewhere, you know, he also, you know, I mean, he, he also defended, uh, he also defended the McCarthy hearings, you know, long oh, yeah. after, you know, long book, after book, the fact. Wrote books defending the man. Yeah, pretty, pretty grotesque. Yeah, for sure. Uh, and yeah, so somebody points, you know, mentioned says in the chat, okay, I thought Barry Goldwater was responsible for pushing the GOP in the direct, that direction. Yeah, I think there's some truth oh. to that, too. Uh, but, uh, but I, th I think that as far as like the many different seeds that, you know, grew into, uh, what became the GOP we know and love today, uh, Buckley was, was a pretty big one, right? Like, I mean, we probably don't want to fall into the trap of saying that, um, you know, conservatism just sort of emerges from the thought process of, you know, conservative intellectuals. Oftentimes it's the other way around and that's a much later, you know, rationalization. Uh, but, um, but he did, I think, yeah, I think that combination of, like you said, Rob, you know, that the trad wives and the Elon Musk types, you know, I, I think owes a lot uh, to uh, to Buckley's influence, you know, that that like Barry Goldwater, the emphasis was very much on the, you know, Elon Musk, you know, side of things to be a little anachronistic about it. Um, in, in fact, to the point that Goldwater later, I mean, a lot of this stuff hadn't come, yet, come up yet in uh, 19, oh yeah. Buckley was definitely a Goldwater supporter. Um, but, you know, a lot of this stuff hadn't come up yet when, you know, Buckley, for example, was supporting him in 1964. But later on, you know, Goldwater actually did, um, you know, make some of his former supporters uh, mad by by taking socially liberal positions on, on things like abortion, uh, which, of course, is completely consistent with the libertarian rhetoric that he used at the time. But, you know, like they thought that was a betrayal. Uh, whereas, whereas Buckley was always very much about taking those, you know, libertarian-ish economic ideas and combining them with, um, 
with hardcore social conservatism of the, you know, we've, we've got to fire all the atheist professors for male variety. Yeah. And two, like this might sound like superficial, but remember like Goldwater was broadly seen to be like this divisive, like kind of a little far to the right figure as Buckley was always seen to be like a very agreeable, decent guy. Sure. He's conservative, but he's civil. Like you can respect him when he's not calling Gore Vidal a queer on camera. He's very, he's very civil, you know, whereas Goldwater's too edgy, sort of a Trump McConnell thing again. Uh, so like Buckley made that so respectable that it was easy to build a party around it and you can get that huge institution of today. Maybe that's uh, a piece of that influence. Yeah, no, totally. Uh, so I think that's, uh, so yeah, I think that's a sense of, of where, uh, Buckley is, uh, and of course anybody who watches do the, uh, the Buckley Baldwin debate knows that he was also, I think the best way to put it is like, I think he varied from being a little evasive to openly evil on civil rights at the time. Um, like, like in the debate with Baldwin, he's a little evasive about some of it. Uh, you know, he, he pulls a lot of the usual conservative moves, you know, the futility thesis, you know, oh, these are just, it's sad that race hatred exists, but there's cultural problems. There's nothing the law can do about it uh, to being very evasive. Like when he, uh, there's a point in that debate, people may remember where, where somebody like heckles him because he says, oh, what can you do? What do you expect us to do? And uh, one of the, um, Oxford students heckles him and says, well, you could let, you know, the Negroes vote in, in Alabama. And, uh, and, and he says, uh, and he has this thing, which he plays in a very witty William F. Buckley kind of way as a laugh line. But I think it's a really interesting answer that he says, oh, if I had my way, most white people in Alabama wouldn't be able to vote either. Yeah. That to me is like, he's very evasive, but not there. Like he does say, well, bear in mind, I'm a conservative. So if I had my way, none of you filthy riffraff would be able to lay a dime on my daddy's money. Like he, he I wish that, that William Buckley tribute bands like Ben Shapiro, as Nathan Robinson called them. Uh, I wish that they would include that realism. Like, let's be clear. If you're some semi-literate blue collar white person, you too are uninvited from the society, but. <laughs> uh, that's that's one small change, at least that we've seen over these many many decades. Is you can't just say like, well, God willing, you will all be disenfranchised in time. <laughs> uh, at least that that is not evasive. So there is at least there is at least a few truth moments. I no, agree, that, he was that, full that, of shit most of the time. Yeah, no, that's true. That that is true, right? It's evasive in the sense that he is like sort of playing it off as a joke, but it's also, I think, literally his view. <laughs> no, no, it's so like that feels sincere. Like that yeah. is not his. Q Yaley idiolect. Yeah, that's his real view. It seems like. No, totally. Uh, all right. So uh, I should also say Michael Harrington, you know, when he wasn't writing books about uh, socialism, uh, which uh, which he did quite a few of. Um, and, and actually, I, I will say like Harrington, uh, you know, I mean, I have my criticisms of, of some of his positions, but he was a, uh, you know, like, you know, I think he was much more radical than than you would think uh, from uh, reading some of what people say about him today. Hmm. So every now and again, like the Wall Street Journal or some god awful you know news organization like that, will uh, publish some op ed. I've, I think I've read like two or three versions of this uh, by somebody you know some like fossil who was a you know leftist you know fifty years ago who will say. Uh, you know, I knew Michael Harrington. He he would not approve of these uncouth, you know, DSA people today who will like, you know, yell at you know Homeland Security people about child detention while they're trying to enjoy a nice meal. Um, but if you actually read Michael Harrington um, again, like like he actually, you know, he actually had you know pretty you know he actually had you know pretty uh, pretty radical views you know for uh, for the most part. I think the the gap between him and and contemporary uh, DSA is uh, much less uh, than, than you would think from uh, from what some people say about this on certain issues it was but um, you know I, I think he I think that um, I think that certainly when it you know when it comes to uh, to Palestinian stuff uh, when it when it comes to like there there are a couple of issues you know where I, I think that uh, I think that the contemporary socialist left has improved considerably on Harrington's positions but uh, but but for the most part, you know, he was there. Um, 
Uh, somebody in chat says, reminds me what David Mitchell, the comedian, says about Tories. Don't worry, they're snobs, not racists. Uh, that's a, yeah, so, you know, it's, <laughs> yeah, it's both and, but yeah, uh, for sure. So anyway, uh, so when he wasn't writing his books about socialism, Harrington wrote a book called The uh, Very Famous Book, uh, probably much more widely read than the ones he wrote about socialism and Marx and all that stuff, called The Other America, uh, which was just about the depths of poverty in the United States. And uh, it was it was seen as an influence on uh, the Johnson administration, um, which obviously did lots of things that you know Harrington disapproved of, like carpet bombing Vietnam and Cambodia. Uh, but it um, you know it's a hell of an asterisk. But uh, it did um, but it did start all these anti poverty programs, which are because Harrington was seen as an influence, and in at least even though he wasn't, of course involved in the administration itself as an influence and in sort of prodding them to do this by writing this book, The Other America. Uh, that's why um, Buckley is kind of taking him to task uh, for this whole, you know, what Buckley thinks is a horrible idea, you know, which is the uh, Johnson administration's war on poverty uh, and trying to kind of tar the war on poverty with association uh, with, um, you know, with, with this horrible radical socialist, Michael Harrington. So I think, that's probably enough background. Let's, uh, Forrest, you want to start us up? Firing line with William F. Buckley Jr. Tonight, a war on poverty. Hope or hopeless. But Michael Harrington, the young and engaging man from whom you're about to hear, uh, and by whom I'm about to be whiplashed, uh, is commonly acknowledged <clears throat> as the man who first declared the war on poverty. The only war he has ever declared, I hasten to add, since as regards orthodox wars, he is a conscientious objector. His most famous book, called The Other America, described a portion of the American population beset by tormenting poverty. Now, that book caught the attention of Professor Walter Heller, who brought it to the attention of President Kennedy on the 19th of November, 1963. Now, that book was a toxin call for massive federal action to uproot American poverty. And President Kennedy tendered his approval for such a program and three days later died. But when Dr. Heller took the subject up with Mr. Kennedy's successor, Mr. Johnson reacted with enthusiasm. And so the war was born towards the prosecution of which we are spending about $2 billion a year. Not nearly enough to satisfy Mr. Harrington, I'm sure he will make clear, with that emotional conciseness for which he is greatly and justifiably famous. Mr. Harrington was, by the way, raised in St. Louis, went to college at Holy Cross and Yale, and took an advanced degree at the University of Chicago, greatly impressing students and faculty alike by his brilliance. Sometime after leaving college, he joined the staff of the Catholic Worker, having first taken, or so the story goes, a pledge of personal poverty. A mutual friend sometime later remarked to me that the foundations of the country are going broke, maintaining Michael Harrington in poverty. But no matter, he has hardly impoverished the social or polemical literature of America, and I welcome him to a discussion of the poverty program and to some of the general problems it raises. We'll be back in a moment with Mr. Harrington. Mr. Harrington, there seems to be uh, all kinds of definitions floating around about what poverty actually consists in. And you're supposed to be some kind of an authority on that subject. How, how do you define poverty for purposes of the poverty program? Well, it's not how I define it. It's how the government does. I'm more interested uh, in your definition. OK, mine's government. the government, because it's become very precise. The government usually does what you tell it. Is that what you oh, mean? Oh, not at all. Not at all. It hasn't done one-tenth of what uh, I would like it to do. But uh, after the president originally declared war on poverty, and after my book, which was fairly vague as to the precise character of poverty, a lot more work was done. Uh, and now we have a very good definition, I think. It says that the upper limit of poverty, the well-off poor, are a family in which the uh, four people living in a city 
uh, in which the woman is presumed to be a good cook and shopper and can spend 22 cents per person per, per meal, or put another way, uh, can spend for the big meal of the day for all four members of the family 95 cents. That's the top. That meal, by the way, is a basic nutritional meal uh, figured out by the Department of Agriculture. And the government's thesis, which I subscribe to, is that if you have an income under that necessary for this meal, uh, you will be choosing between necessities. You will have to have less than enough food in order to have decent housing or clothing or medicine. If, if you're making the point that people have to eat, I will concede it, uh, in order to live. But what disturbs me is that there are a number of professional students of the problem who raise it's a generous concession questions and points that in your copious literature on the subject you simply haven't disposed of very easily by that um, three thousand dollar figure for instance that, that you rely on so heavily uh, so heavily over 50 percent of the united states was poor in 1929 and yet that is historically known as one of the exuberant years in american history isn't that correct don't you really go further and say that poverty is defined by the relative uh, <clears throat> uh, scarcity of funds in the society in which you live. The people whom you call poor in the United States would be considered rich in India or Latin America, would they not? Well, first of all, let me clarify a fact, which is I don't use a 3,000 criterion, and neither does the government. Uh, we use a criterion of <clears throat> $3,130 for an urban family of four. Well, there must have been inflation since I read no, this. No, no, the, uh, it's not an inflation. It's that we have made much more precise and answered the objections, which were in some cases validly raised, that we did not specify for family size, for people living in the country, et cetera. Secondly, there is a sense in which the poverty definition is relative, historically relative. <clears throat> uh, to tell a poor person without enough food in Appalachia that he's better off than an Indian peasant is called comfort to him. Because he doesn't live in India, he lives in Appalachia. Well, that's what I'm, I'm trying to reach for. But, in other words, uh, uh, to a considerable extent, the subjective uh, feelings of the person you're addressing are relevant. No, uh, sure, of course they're relevant. Yeah, yeah. But, well, uh, well, don't say quite of course, because uh, some people think they are not relevant. No, but if you'll notice... Unless we des describe poverty as something a little bit different. The definition that I gave was one not predicated mm -hmm. on the subjective feelings of that Appalachian poor person but predicated on the amount of nutritional material necessary, given our standards, for a most minimal diet, assuming, which is not a, uh, always the case, uh, that uh, they will use money in the most uh, precise and exact way to feed themselves. Hunger, lack of nutrition, loss of lifespan, uh, disease, these things are not relative. These things, a person who is hungry in Appalachia is as hungry or has the same experience as a person in India. Well, but you, I, th I thought a moment ago that you, you leaned rather heavily on an escape clause. You said that people are, are poor who, if they had to, uh, if they had to reroute some of the money that would be spent on their nutrition to other, quote, necessities, uh, <clears throat> would be people who would fall under your program. Now, uh, going over the statistics, one sees that, for instance, 15% of the people who are officially classed as poor under this definition, bought new cars the year before last. Now, would you say a new car is a necessity under this psychic definition or under the more objective definition? Now, first of all, most of this new... Wow, a lot of uh, classic right-wing saws being birthed in this debate that you can see. Yeah, for sure. Force no pause for a minute. Yeah, there's a, a, already a fair amount of garbage to take to the curb at this point, so that would be smooth, yeah. I mean, this is great, you know, all your classic things, like get, get the opponent to get dogged down in, like, numerical details, that's great. Like, where exactly is the do dollar cutoff at the time we're having this debate? And, of course, very often conservatives will say, is, well, it's all relative, you know. I have a million dollars, but I feel poor <laughs> compared to Mike Bloomberg. So everyone is poor and rich, yeah, and there's that, no need to redistribute that exact my daddy's line money. The, um, the, the poor people in the United States would be considered rich in India. I mean, that, that's something you hear all the time now. Yeah, and so, so I mean, that's an issue though, because surely, like, there is a relative aspect to poverty, but it's relative to how rich the country is. Right. Like, if you live, yeah, if you live in, yeah, you know, an incredibly penniless country years in the past, they have no resources, there's no buildup industrial standard there's no sense to like expect health care and consider it an impact on your freedom if you don't get it right. or to you know you can't feel you could say that that's relative poverty though 
it's relative to what the economy can produce. If everyone in the country is poor and there's just a very low level of economic activity, well, okay, everyone's going to be poor. There's no wealth to redistribute. But if some people have psychotically large fortunes right. and they monopolize that wealth and that keeps everyone else from having those minimal necessities, and Harrington clearly gets toward the main issue there when he brings up necessities. Choosing among necessities, he should have just gone straight to that. As soon as you bring in exactly the dollar threshold, you're starting to lose people, I'm sad to say. Yeah. But like that gets to the issue. Once the economy can afford for everyone to have a minimal standard of food and housing, or these days, you know, health insurance and internet access, and you're not providing it because your existing economic structures in terms of trade favor people who are already millionaires or billionaires who come from, yeah, you know, oil money like Buckley's family does, you know, like that's when it becomes unacceptable. It's relative, all right, but it's relative to how wealthy the country is. But then also, Buckley muddies those waters because he says, well, Everyone knows 1929, according to your standard, a quarter of the country was poor or half the, whatever he exactly said. Yeah. But of course, we all know 1929 was when everyone was rich. <laughs> fool. Like, fool, that's GDP per capita is our standard yeah. economic term to measure how wealthy a country is. And it's a great measurement because you take GDP, like the national income, all the money made in the economy in a year, and just divide it by the population. It's a very easy calculation to do, but it just assumes that every man, woman, and child gets the same amount. And I hate to say this. Yeah. That is not the case. I'm afraid that it is not the case. No, well, so I'm just amazed how many how many incorrect right-wing talking points he packed into that small amount of time. No, well, for sure. Why he became famous. Yeah, 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 yeah absolutely. Uh, I should all, I mean, honestly, when he said the thing about 1929, like, it just seemed like I mean, I, I mean, I think you might even be giving him too much credit with the GDP thing. You know, I mean, like it, it seemed like what he's really appealing to is this kind of cultural sense that in 1929, everything was great. It was the it was the swinging 20s. Come on, you know, read some F. Scott, F. Scott Fitzgerald novels. It sounds great, you know, and it's like, yeah, uh, I mean, I understand that was the time that a lot of people who were, you know, ruined uh, not long after, you know, were still doing very well. Uh, but there were, you know, there was a massive massive part of the country in uh in 1929 uh that was that was that was suffering horribly i mean this is the uh i mean you know this this is like i mean look those those people who who ended up getting you know getting shot at you know when when they were you know marching on washington for their promised world war one bonuses you know it's not like they were doing great in 1929 that's a perfect point. Yeah, that's uh, yeah. Not a lot of bonus army veterans and uh, black sharecroppers telling us how great it was in 1929. It's a wealthy guy from money. Hmm. Yeah. Hmm. Right. Exactly. Right. And and his, you know, and his. I thought it was that, sure. There were lots of people who might not have been as wealthy as the Buckley family, you know, who were doing well in 1929. But this idea that it's wildly implausible that half of the country was living in poverty in 1929, it's like I don't know why. I mean, what that's that sounds right to me. It sounds pretty damn plausible, you know. And again, though, it's just that relativity. By this time, the U.S. had a gigantic economy very capable and only more today. It's a much richer country now than it was in Buckley's time. Capitalism yeah. means growth as we all recognize people on the right are always shocked when leftists recognize this because they don't engage with us because they're lazy cowards. What are you going to do? I've, I've never read the opening pages of the communist manifesto. It's not asking like a huge amount. <laughs> like it's like, especially with all like the let's debate. First, yeah, especially the with the let's debate page. bullshit these guys talk. Like you think that at least read yeah like the introductory thing of something like that yeah which is it's short too i mean yeah so already not uh, winning huge awards for engagement i'm concerned about this william buckley i'm not sure he's as great as i thought going into this i'm worried yeah, yeah fair enough um but uh but yeah i i should just say so you know so harrington i think because he doesn't want to get bogged down in um in a bunch of, you know, discussions about poverty being relative, you know, he's giving this absolute definition, which is basically, can you afford to eat adequately? Uh, and, you know, that, which, you know, again, seems at the very least, let's put it this way, just be a, just be an analytic philosophy nerd about this. At the very least, I think we should be able to agree that if the answer is no, that's at least a sufficient condition uh, for, uh, for living in poverty, uh, you know, whether or not it's a necessary one. Uh, and, and I think that, uh, and I think that your point about there being a 
pretty coherent and commonsensical relative definition is a good one. And it's worth, it's worth underlining that, you know, that, that I think one totally reasonable way to define poverty uh, is as having a, you know, grotesquely insufficient share of what there is to go around in a given society. Um, and, sh and yeah, that will be different in 1929 and in, you know, the mid sixties, you know, when this debate is happening and it'll be, you know, you know, different in, in immediately post-colonial India and in the United States, you know, but, um, but that does seem like at least a important definition. For sure. And maybe one last thing to throw in and I'll shut up yeah. so we can actually watch some more of this. But there was the very first thing that comes up, though, is we are now spending two billion dollars on this war on poverty. And the whole, you know, anytime you talk to a conservative about how we should have Medicare for all or fight climate change, they'll say, well, it's expensive. You got to look at the cost and benefit, right. which is not itself unreasonable. But then they look at the cost and no benefit. Like it costs two billion dollars. That's bad. And mention it's the country's growing, going broke with these two billions of dollars. Meanwhile, how much for Vietnam and killing poor people? Like you know, a lot more yeah, than yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. But there's sure. not even a single moment saying, "Oh, poverty is terrible. It throws away the potential of children. It makes people live in misery and fear and insecurity their whole lives." Just the price tag, and now we've disparaged him enough to win over the audience. So again, these are all awful right wing tasks that we all got to, uh, you know, verbal maneuvers we got to learn to recognize as we give them arguments. So. Keep an eye on folks. All right, let's you can roll. run up a quick bingo card. We're urged against the first definition, not the one that I'm using. Uh, that is to say, one has to study the literature and know what the government now says, not what it said two years ago. Secondly, it does happen to be the case that in rural areas of the country, for a poor farm worker or farmer, a car is indeed an absolute necessity because he doesn't have a bus or subway. But car, more basically, I think the real apparently. argument between us the real argument between us is that in the 19th century, the conservative said to the tuberculosis-ridden, uh, immiserated British worker, think mm. of how better off you are than a medieval knight. And the real issue is not how better off than an Indian peasant, an American poor person is, but how better off he could be if we lived up to our social responsibility. Well, but don't you think some, some people uh, believe that the problem is not... Uh, uh, one as regards what would be, what would ideally obtain. Uh, ideally, not only would there not be uh, any poverty here, there would be no poverty anywhere else in the world. And to that end, uh, we have from time to time committed ourselves uh, and uh, are at this moment engaged, for instance, in sending a billion dollars worth of grain to, to India. So I think that the people who criticize the poverty program uh, do so to some extent with reference to the resources of the society. And then, of course, it gets terribly confusing because, although you've been very well disciplined in your definition of poverty, uh, in fact, a lot of the literature on the poverty uh, problem describes not only ma ma material poverty, but a poverty of a completely different order. Uh, Paul Jacobs, whom, whom you know and admire, has written that the poor in America are not so much physical as psychological paupers. And the economist Henry Wallach has said poverty seems to be primarily a, a social condition. They're talking about loneliness, alienation, no, they're, and they're, all of those they're problems. Talking, again, they're talking about, the, uh, let me not speak for, for Paul Jacobs or Wallach, let me speak for myself. I do not talk simply of some non-quantifiable thing called loneliness. I talk about the fact that the rate of psychosis and neurosis that is observed by the public authorities among poor people is two, three, four, and five times greater than among anyone else. Uh, and that far from the American myth, uh, that those who suffer on estates in Connecticut have the terrible uh, pangs and mm. the torments of affluence, while the noble savage is in the slums, far from that myth. In fact, uh, the estate owners have uh, much less neurotic and psychotic lives than the poor people. That being kicked around and being pushed down and living in dense, miserable housing and dealing with cockroaches and rats uh, are not the kinds of things that make one a... Uh, a balanced, a content, uh, normal, and adjusted, healthy personality. Yes, and, and I, I couldn't agree with you more, but I'm, I'm trying to raise the following uh, a problem, uh, namely, to, to what extent is a poverty program that is materially designed to dissipate such difficulties as you have elaborated, to what extent can we count on it uh, to alle alleviate all of these concomitant uh, miseries? Paul Jacobs, for instance, 
uh, says that, that one of the things about poor people is, is that they don't receive letters, they don't receive mail. Uh, and, and, and I think that he says it very poignantly, i.e. that this, this, this is one of the great afflictions, especially in a, in a modern and hectic society, that when people are no longer useful, somehow they very often get dropped. But do you really think that the government through a highly bureaucratized poverty government can, can reach in and help a person of that kind? Or aren't you really, really stuck because what is at fault with this society is that an ethos of a kind that did make even very poor people happier than, than relatively rich people are today uh, made it possible for them to come to grips with their existence? Well, leave you, you, after all, do despise our social order. You don't believe there's such a thing as, as, as religion. And uh, under the circumstances, you are in your active polemical life doing very much that, in my judgment, has the effect of depriving people of some of the consolations and some of the truths that might make them more serene. Well, could I have a... There's so much that's been tossed at me, if I could have a, a second. First of all, put aside for a moment uh, whether the federal uh, poverty program is highly bureaucratized, as you characterize it, because I think that's a shibboleth. But leave that aside for the moment. To get to the basic point, uh, can a materially oriented public program affect the inner psychological torment of the poor? And the answer, I think, is to a certain degree, yes, to a certain degree, no. For example, uh, in 1955, during the Montgomery bus boycott in Montgomery, Alabama, Martin Luther King and the leadership of the boycott did not make a single speech to the Negroes in Montgomery about uh, stop criminal behavior. But because the life of the Negro in Montgomery took on a dignity and meaning and purpose without anybody mentioning crime, there was a decline of about 20% in the amount of crime among Negroes of Montgomery. Uh, similarly, this year, the government has given us some figures that would indicate that if we would put more income into the slums, the incidence of broken families would drop because one of the big reasons that families break up uh, is because there's not enough money, because a man can't be an economic father, because many of our welfare programs literally penalize marriage by refusing any kind of welfare as long as there's an able-bodied, although unemployed or poor male in the house. So I'm saying yes, by, by material federal action, we can change some of these circumstances and improve some of the psychological and spiritual life of the poor. I have no doubt uh, you're correct, and we'll get back to that. Um, I have a cue over here we're supposed to pause for a moment. So um, I, I, I do want to just, just flag a couple things here. So, um, so one of them, um, you know, so one of them is if you read like Michael Harrington's 1988 book, uh, The Long Distance Runner, uh, I think you'll see that in between, you know, whenever this debate happened in the 60s and, and the late 80s, I, I, I think that he'd... Um, absorbed uh the uh the feminist critique of of american society as it existed then in a way that he hadn't really yet here you know he's he's made several comments that you know just sort of take it for granted that of course you know the man will be the breadwinner and you know all these things like that that's just uh that's just a side note uh but i think as far as uh the enduring things that are uh, that are going on here uh one thing i'm, I'm sure you clocked rob is um this I, I think that there's there's this argument here that uh, you still like if you were arguing with conservatives in 2020, you know, you'll absolutely run into the same thing uh, about whether the you know basically like whether um, the problems that go with poverty are basically cultural problems with cultural solutions. Uh, you know, whatever the hell that means, right? You know, just just get everybody to individually, you know, be more virtuous. Uh, or, or whether there are larger structural uh, economic uh, economic causes, uh, you know, causes for this, right? You know, is uh, so, um, and you know, Buckley is is very obviously trying, you know, trying to push the first position. Yeah, that's. I have to say, I was thinking about this now. This is why it's always very stimulating to watch wrong people talk because it does help you turn over your own uh, arguments in your head, as we've discovered in our books, where it's. Nothing but confronting uh, incorrect ideas. Yeah, I got to say um, something about the uh, focus of the right wing on uh, issues of poverty and culture when they're talking about aiding the poor is very touching because it's the only time they're concerned about it. 
you know, like, well, if we if we have a materially designed program to give some money and rent support and food stamps to these filthy poor people, will that change their culture so they just feel they rely on it and they won't work for my daddy's factory? Right. I'm concerned about that. But, you know, if we free the slaves, will that fix their ethos? <laughs> I think not. Like, this is so intellectually formidable. But the other thing, though, is just how quickly this disappears. When it's, well, I don't like Russia and China, and I think I'm scared of them. Like, well, let's change our military's ethos. I'm just kidding. Here's a trillion dollars. Right, like, right, as soon right, as right, it's right. the military or subsidies for the oil and gas industry, or tax cut for me and my rich family, or the corporation whose stock we own, then there's none of this bullshit, smushy culture garbage. It's like, should yeah, Exxon yeah, yeah, work yeah. on its culture before it gets a subsidy from the energy department? No, we'll just take the check, thank you. Culture reform is so that we don't have to give money to poor black families. Like, that's what that is for. Yeah, so, right. Like, whatever you're talking about, companies creating jobs, you know, and, and stuff like that, the assumption is that uh, those decision makers... Oh, you might want to turn down your volume a little bit. Get you a little echo. Um, but yeah, the assumption is always that that those decision makers uh, are going to have completely material you know, motivations that uh, that they'll you know that they'll they'll make decisions that they'll get much you know they'll get more money you know as a result of making. Uh, whereas when you're talking about um, when you're talking about all of the sort of pathologies that that accompany poverty, you know the, the assumption is that you just need to decide to be more virtuous, uh, even though. Uh, in many of these cases, like what Harrington's pointing out there at the end before they went to uh, to commercial break, uh, is that some of the things they point to, not all of it, right? Like some of this is just, you know, being human, you know, like some, like, like sometimes, you know, sometimes you're going to be miserable regardless of the economics. But a lot of the things they're pointing to are actually the results of economic causes. Uh, so, uh, for example, I'm sure you've run into this bullshit, the... Uh, uh, a thing that a lot of contemporary conservatives have picked up on and some neoliberal centrist types have also, but mostly conservatives is uh, this idea they call the, su the success sequence. Yes. I've, I'm familiar with Ben Shapiro's patented success secrets. Yes. Sequence. I mean, yes. Yeah. yeah. yeah the success sequence is this idea that, uh, Oh, if you look at the statistics, then it turns out that, um, what you have to do to be successful, if you read the fine print, that basically just means like there's some, you know, whatever, like it's this extremely minimal standard. But, um, you know, to not fall beyond that minimal standard is that uh, you, um, that you wait to have kids until you get married and you do get married and, you know, basically just sort of conservative cultural preoccupation. Stay in like school, that. get a job. Yes. Yeah, it's yeah. Uh, pretty predictable. Yeah. And of course, as as uh, friend Matt Brunig uh, likes to point out, that the uh, the the cheat code, the thing that's doing all the actual heavy lifting, is the get a job part. You know that that's uh, yeah, out. you know, and that and that hidden hand of your family income. I mean, you know, like that is the thing that correlates with you know stable enough surroundings that you can focus on school and you know like you know, like cultivate a reading habit and junk like that. Like that takes a certain amount of stability. And if you're moving from house to house, because you know, you're being raised by a single mom or a you know a family unit that's just poor. I mean, it's a lot harder to just have that the the basic feet on the ground that this success sequence takes for granted. I mean that, and everyone knows how well correlated your family's income is with future family income. Like it's no, totally. Uh, it's not and, a lockdown thing, but it exists. Yeah, and and the point that Harrington is making at the end is is a really important one about all this, which is that like we're so used to hearing this in some form or another that, that it, it just, you know, you don't even hear it like as uh, like it, it just sort of, Oh yeah, no, sure. You're not along. That sounds right. But nobody has ever actually been able to explain like, okay, wait a second. What's, if you think the direction of causation goes like you have stable family relationships, therefore you're not poor. Like how does that work exactly? Like, like, like what's this magical causation from, you know, having to marry, you know, being married for a long time, to like your your family unit having a lot you know having like a certain amount of income that's really hard to say whereas yeah. it's very easy to say as harrington is pointing out at the end it's very easy to say how it works in the other direction uh because 
look, I mean, just, just common sense. What does anybody like fight about? One of the main things that people fight about is money, financial anxiety. Uh, if you're, uh, if you're super stressed all the time about paying yeah. your bills and how you're going to pay your bills, then there are, there's a lot more anxiety and stress in your life. And, you know, so you're less likely to be able to maintain a relationship for a long time. So yeah, sure. People below a certain economic threshold, you know, are more likely to, you know, to, uh, have the, um, you know, less stable, you know, less stable relationships, but that doesn't tell you that like somehow, like it's almost like cargo cult weirdness, like thinking that yeah. like, Oh, well, you know, they just like, they just, you know, absorb those trad values, you know, they'll somehow, you know, that'll somehow lead to like greater income, uh, you know, which is, um, you know, which is funny because like the same people will propound this stereotype of the, you know, dirt poor, but virtuous, you know, simple people. But, uh, but no, that doesn't make sense. The way that makes sense is you alleviate some of those financial pressures and it's a lot easier for people to stay together. Yeah, for that that's very well put. That's like a it is a perfect cause and effect. Just a perfect causality reversal. Yeah. I mean, it's much easier to be stable when you have like money. That everyone knows that's the most common cause of fights among spouses, supposedly, is money. It's certainly plausible, of course. Yeah, I mean, and, I mean, uh, it's to me, like the defining the feature. Top few. Yeah. But to me, it's like the defining feature of poverty, especially these days, like isn't so much just like abject hunger. It's just insecurity. Like, right. oh, I'm behind on the rent or how am I going to afford this in a month when this runs out? Like that's the defining fucking feature of poverty is just like not no, not having a stable platform to live on You know, in, in many scenarios, at least. And certainly for people who are renting, I mean, then that's just – Right. which is most of course of uh, people and certainly most of the poor. So that's uh, that's pretty perfectly well put. Yeah. To say, well, just get better culture and you'll stop being poor. And I, Harrington, you know, uh, to me, I, I listen to him speak and I, I just think like, Oh, it should be sharper. It's not punchy enough. He fundamentally, of course, like is on the basic issues here. Like all those mental uh, is issues as they were construed at that time, like are strongly correlated with being poverty because they're aggravated by them. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. All of those things, you know, that, that, yeah, being, being, you know, financially stressed, uh, certainly the kinds of conditions he's describing, you know, that, that he wrote about, you know, about, uh, rats and cockroaches, you, you know, cockroaches, I guess is how he talks. Yeah, I enjoyed that. that. Yeah. Uh, St. Louis <laughs> usage, I guess. <laughs> yeah. Uh, like, yeah, these are all things that, that, that tend to, nice. uh, to make you less happy and well adjusted, you know, if you have to, uh, you have to deal with them, you know, which is, which is not very, uh, which is not very mysterious, you know, like if, you know, like there's a good, um, yeah. you know, like, like, like it, it sort of seems like, yeah, sure. Uh, you know, everybody is an individual, you know, human being with, you know, their particular, you know, everything, but, um, there are some basic needs that everybody has that are fairly universal. And once you get those taken care of, it's a lot easier to then, you know, turn to worrying about everything else. Yeah, fair enough. Uh, it's, it seems simple enough, but it, it, this is really useful. It's nice to see how long in the tooth these arguments really are and how they have slightly changed over time. But yeah, I mean, just imagine the difference just as a kid. I always think of these issues as, you know, young people don't just come out with their abilities. Like they do develop over time in their early environment. That's a very a thing people are very sensitive to. You know, when I grew up with professional class parents, my old man was a professor, uh, before me and you know, my mom had a nice professional job. So I grew up with, you know, tons of books. I'm at my folks place right now, of course, for the holiday. And it's, this house is built out of books. It's great. It's a very stable environment. You know, we've never had to worry about that stuff. So you have that, just that basic foundation. If you're going from place to place and it's filled, yeah, with like animal parasites. You know, imagine that, like that's, that will, that will uh, drain your psychic energy coping with that scenario. It's going to make it a lot harder to relax and focus on reading the classics at a precocious age. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Oh, yeah. Let's, uh, let's watch a few more minutes. Uh, Mr. Harrington, I, the, the reason I mentioned your own, uh, your own political faiths is because uh, necessarily uh, I think that they are relevant insofar as you are a leader of the poverty program. You you are primarily interested, of course, in changing the social order. You have a great uh, and eloquent contempt for capitalism, even, I gather, for those achievements of capitalism which made it possible to accumulate a surplus which uh, uh, which can go to, to the poor. Now, you, you are 
in some people's eyes, primarily interested in the poverty program, not because they doubt the integrity of your own interests uh, in the poor, but because you find it uh, a means by which to advance a social revolution. Uh, you, um, after all, uh, dedicated your last book to one Trotskyite, one socialist, and one left Democrat. Uh, and, uh, and you have always been very unambiguous about this. Uh, this. This is hardly one of your secrets. Now, those, those of us who believe uh, that the poverty program is in some way related uh, to the success of the free, free enterprise system, on the one hand, need to oppose you as you profiteer on the poverty program for your own ideological ends. And on the other hand, uh, we need to try to be apparently more convincing than we have been uh, to, to make you study the figures uh, which show that uh, only 23% of the American people uh, reach the poverty level, or, or, or only 23% of the people are, are today are making uh, less money than 63% of the people in 1929. That is to say, uh, our own system has given us over a period of 30 years the greatest net rise uh, in, uh, in public income uh, in the history of, um, of economics. Now, uh, at what point do you feel that your devotion to revolution, peace, peaceful revolution, to be sure, in this country, uh, is really dominating your thoughts? Uh, at what point are you willing to concede that your interest in poverty uh, is, in effect, a vested interest, and that if the free enterprise system dissipated poverty completely, uh, you would still uh, be, you'd be left rather embarrassed without some sort of a medium to advance your revolutionary zeal? Well, briefly, the answer is at no point. Uh, mm -hmm. Let me clarify it uh, simply. Uh, first of all, I'm not a leader of the federal government's poverty program. I specifically, I was not offered a job. But I specifically did not take a job because, although I appreciate the beginning effort and I'm for it, I want to be out calling for more and not saying that what we've done is enough. I don't believe it is. So I'm not a leader. Secondly, let me say uh, unambiguously that there is nothing socialist or revolutionary about the present poverty program. Uh, the nature of the American enterprise system and its ownership is left totally intact. General Motors has not been touched. As a matter of fact, one of my criticisms of the poverty program is that the Herald Tribune uh, about a year ago said uh, uh, blue chip corporations looking at poverty program. And there are big corporations which are diversifying uh, by getting into the job training uh, business. I don't like that sort of thing. But the present program is a liberal, ameliorative reform program. Uh, I'm delighted to debate socialism at some mm, point, yeah. but the poverty program is not socialist. Well, one yeah. last point, about it, because maybe clear up all of the things that you put on the table, and that is uh, contempt for capitalism. I don't like capitalism. I think it's much less uh, than, uh, well, I think it's a, a mythological system uh, in that we talk of free enterprise, that we have gigantic uh, concentrated corporations. But I agree that it is exactly the magnificent accomplishments of American enterprise and capitalism and business and the kind of dog-eat-dog -dog misery that we went through that now makes it possible for us to be decent. And I think that when we finally do get a modicum of justice in the society, uh, we should uh, revere uh, those, uh, those dog-eat-doggers who, who did make it possible. Well, uh, perhaps contempt uh, was too strong a word. Which is, again, um, on capitalism. like literally, you just have to read the first few pages of the Communist Manifesto. Practically every it's this idea that and capitalism and develops the economy in ways that creates all this growth and lays the foundations for uh, redistribution uh, or even a new social system. I mean, that's 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 just like bog standard, you know, leftism like this. And, and like that's that that really does feel a little lazy that like in exactly the way you were saying earlier, Rob, that like, you know, it, it just seems like treating that as if, ooh, I'm going to get him with this, you know, that's like, oh, have you ever thought that, you know, the achievements of capitalism, you know, uh, lay the foundations, you know, for, for what you want? And, and of course, I mean, yes, sure, this is mid 60s television it's extremely polite but uh but you know but but harrington's reaction is what it should be which is yeah sure okay <laughs> yeah that is it is impressive yeah from 1968 from buckley in 68 to jordan peterson in 2018 like the right will not read a page like they won't read the first page i mean 
you know, I, I think we make the manifesto too central sometimes to socialist ideas. It's, uh, you know, it's an old document, but surely like if you're like, I'm the king of crushing socialists, you would at least read the little 30 page pamphlet and the first pages just discuss this. But of course, yeah, like this is the big, the main right wing claim, you know, is that, well, you know, we don't need a poverty program and we don't need to worry so much about uh, helping people who are poor because we have economic growth because we have capitalism which is prone to economic growth, which is broadly accurate. That is the case historically. But then they don't want to like look at, again, n- now the material facts are working against them. So it's just, well, there's growth. And people are on average richer now. He again referred to the yeah. big growth in you know national income from the 20s to the 60s, which is accurate, leaving out who gets how much of it. And of course, when they were speaking, that's the, you know, the, the American golden age during the Cold War of strong unions and aggressive taxes on people who were wealthier, even wealthier than the Buckleys. Um, that's something they all want to forget now. But you know, I especially like Buckley on this subject, because uh, as, I, as I put in the uh, introduction to the uh, Capitalism versus Freedom book, like writing uh, when uh, Milton Friedman, of course, is like the great right wing economist who's associated with Buckley in the National Review. Friedman dies in 2006 right during the feverish buildup of the housing bubble before the big finance crash in 2008. And so Buckley, uh, writing an obituary for Friedman said, you know, he was so, you know, he had such a beneficial influence and the era since 1980 has been the era of, or the age of Friedman economically, starting with Reagan and Thatcher and all those folks. Now, of course, Friedman dies in 2006 and Buckley dies in, I believe, February of 2008. So they are both spared having to eat crow or whatever during when they see the entire edifice collapse later in the year of Buckley's death. What's especially interesting is, so Buckley says that this era since the great Reagan and Thatcher is the era of, of uh, Friedman economically. And of course he was giving his William Buckley stamp of approval on that. This is how you fight oh. poverty. It's through all the growth we get from it. And he said, like we've had the uh, writing then, you know, we've had 35 years of economic growth. What's interesting is, you know, now we have a lot more research on the change in incomes and wealth. And so if we look at the Western world, like US, Canada and Western Europe, say like the classic West that people love so much. Uh, it's interesting because since 1980, since the beginning of that age of Friedman, this is all about economic growth. Conservatives will say we don't need a poverty program to split up the pie differently and give more of the pie to the poor. Let's grow the pie through the economic growth that we don't understand socialists are aware of because we're lazy cowards. We don't read their books. We'll have more growth that'll feed everybody. Well, what we know from the research now is that since 1980 in the Western world, that wealthiest 1%, that richest one out of 100 families or households got 28% of the growth in incomes from 1980, that total increase in uh, incomes in those countries, that 1% got the 28% of that growth. The bottom half of America and Europe got 9% of that growth over an almost 40 year period. Like that collapse in their income growth like is correlated with their support for people like Trump and Le Pen and Nigel Farage. Like these people getting left behind and turning fascist y because people like Corbyn and Sanders are blocked out of primaries and shut on by every commercial media outlet that we have. But the reality is we gave you 40 more years, Buckley, to put in what you said was this great era. Mm-hmm. And it turns out most of that wealth goes to the wealthiest 10% and especially the one and then 0.1% pyramiding that income up. Just to throw in a little bit of gross economic data there, there is a record of right. doing what Buckley says and it's the opposite of what he says will happen. Yeah, and it's and I, I think it's an important point that, uh, and this is not one of those like, you know, he said, she said things about, oh, okay, you know, were they really doing what you said or whatever by his own account? doing doing what what he wanted right he was like hey good job you've been doing what i want uh and also it is worth pointing out along the same lines you know um that if you know if the era from 1980 onwards you know was the uh the age of uh friedman economically uh you know the the late you know mid to late 60s you know when they're having this debate you know i mean look i mean clearly we were not living under socialism to put it mildly in the johnson administration but um, as people, you know, have seen point out in the chat, um, like this is worth underlining that the sort of post-war prosperity that exists wasn't just a result of the uh, the working out of uh, of laissez-faire capitalism, you know, in, in an unhindered fashion. 
Uh, it was a result of a massive, massive intervention, uh, both from uh, from the bottom of society through like the strongest labor unions that that had, uh, you know, had ever or have ever uh, existed in American society. You know, highest you know percentage of unionization. Uh, interfering in the market in that direction, and from the top uh, with uh, with a with massive doses of state intervention, starting with the New Deal, really going into overdrive during World War II, continuing as you said into the you know even in the Eisenhower era when you know in fact Kennedy cut them a little bit, but you know top marginal tax rates were like ninety percent you know at one point uh, you, you know I mean people always say. People who don't understand how marginal tax rates say always think they work, always thinks it's an own to say, yeah, hardly anybody's paying that. It's like, yeah, that's, you know, whatever, it doesn't matter. Uh, but uh, then, um, and of course, also not for nothing, like part of the, re, you know, part of the equation here, part of why the American economy was doing so awesome, you know, in the, uh, in the 50s and 60s is that in the 1940s, uh, we had uh, we bombed the hell out of the industrial infrastructure of our major rivals, you know, which which definitely helps, you know, give you a competitive edge in global markets. Yeah, nothing like physically destroying your competitors. That really that really will is surprisingly good at favoring your market position. Yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly. So it's not like, you know, I mean, like it's you know all of which maybe is just worth reciting just just to really underline how this is not just that. Um, you know the the cocktail of factors that led to that long post war boom. You know was 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 certainly composed of lots of things besides just you know the invisible hand. You know doing what you know the first chapter of your you know econ one one textbook says it will. Indeed, yeah, this is what people call the gold conservatives see this as the golden age of capitalism, and it's the most compromised that American capitalism's ever been. Yeah, you know. Yeah, in the 50s, I forget the year, but you had the peak in union density in the U.S. And it's like 30 odd percent. Like it's a limited compared to all the other countries in the developed world, of course. But like that's a real number. It helps all those other workers who, you know, whose employers are competing with, you know, unionized workers. And rather than get a union in here, let's give you a relatively good worker uh, health insurance program. Once we crush unions, we'll take that away and give you co-pay so high you go bankrupt as soon as you have a car crash. Uh, but at that time, all those compromises that were forced on capitalism by that crazy labor movement and, you know, and the civil rights movement, too, right. and like all these things that put constraints uh, on the uh, U.S. Uh, economic uh, uh, superstructure, like a little of that went a long way. We get that long era of growth uh, that everyone's so proud of. Then the 80s, we took it all apart. And I mean, here we are. It's a fucking mess. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, that uh, I mean, I, and I think that. Um, yeah, I guess also since you mentioned health insurance, it's worth noting that I think 1950. Uh, that's uh, the uh, what's sometimes called the Treaty of Detroit, uh, which were these uh, unusually long contracts negotiated between Walter Ruther's UAW uh, and the uh, the big three automakers to to end a period of prolonged you know um, labor militancy when there have been a lot of really disruptive you know strikes going on all the time. Uh, and and part of that 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 you know turned out to be a long term strategic error definitely on Ruther's part. Uh, the Sean Richmond talks about this in his book uh, "Tell the Bosses We're Coming," uh, is that they had been resistant to uh, pushing for employer health benefits um, before that uh, because because they they wanted to focus on um, advocating um, Medicare for all basically. Uh, which, which you know, to be fair, which was much more mainstream at the time. Truman said he supported it, uh, and and they then they decided the the rationalization at the time was okay. Well, if employers are saddled with the cost of health insurance, then uh, they'll have an incentive to help us push for for Medicare for all later, and um, didn't work out that way. Well, uh, time makes fools of us all. That's what I'd say. At least at least we were trying at that stage. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. Um, and and also actually, um, I, I think you know maybe everybody who's watching this you know knows this, but you know since I think the I think really you can't repeat this enough, uh, and it, it goes to a really fundamental point about you know uh, capitalism versus freedom. Uh, the the reason you know it, it is really worth thinking about why that calculation uh, turned out to be um, uh, to be wrong. Right. Like, like, like why, you know, like, sure. Cause, cause on paper, right. I mean, uh, why, why should, you know, Walmart or, you know, General Motors then or Walmart now 
you know, want to pay for, for everybody's uh, health insurance. You know, that's a huge cost. Why not offload that onto the federal government? And of, uh, of course, the reason for that is. It's a, it's a very, very convenient tool of control over you. It's you lose your job in America. It's, you know, like in France, you lose your job. It's bad, but you keep your health insurance. Like here, it's an extra arm of control. I mean, that's the first thing I think of. I mean, no, no, exactly right. 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 I mean, it's, it's they, they, like they, I think that the employer class correctly calculates that, um, that they get more in the long run from, from having a more subservient workforce uh, because their health insurance is tied to their jobs. And, you know, what, what happens if I'm, you know, what happens if, if, you know, even if I'm only between jobs for a month, you know, what happens if there's some medical emergency, you know, that comes out and that would help on that month. Uh, and, you know, I need to take my kid to the hospital or whatever, you know, I, I think that they, they correctly calculate, they get more out of having, uh, you know, workers that need to worry about stuff like that. And are thus like less likely to cause trouble than they, then, then they lose uh, in having to, uh, to pay for, uh, for health insurance, which, you know, as we know, um, you know, private health insurance in the United States, you know, is, uh, even for people who have it, you know, is, is often nothing to write home about, but, um, let's, uh, let's keep going. Void by capitalism. Some people would find, um, contemptuous at least. Well, no, this but, is something but, I think you would agree let, with let, me let, let me, uh, well, no, I think you would agree because what I was saying I, is that I, the old free enterprise or the, oh, no, the old market economy that you revere and want us to go back to, the old free enterprise or the man who saved up string and made a big business, whom you look back to as a great man, that man is going. We're having the organization man. Now. Well, I've been hearing that for 25 years. I mean, well, we have 75 25 million years. jobs, uh, which we were told was impossible back when we had a mature economy with 42 million jobs. So, so I, I have a certain amount of faith in uh, capitalism and suggest that... Um, it's likely even to survive your own strictures against it. But uh, I, I, I am very much interested in your saying that there is nothing at all socialistic. Uh, to, to use the word in the way that you're using it is highly old fashioned. Nobody anymore thinks of socialism as involved, it's involving purely the uh, ownership of the means of production. Obviously, it's a socialistic program. Uh, socialistic in the sense that it is uh, financed and governed uh, and directed by a central uh, authority that it uh, does not encourage a private means by which much of the same thing can be done. Uh, the federal government, and this is typical of the socialist bias, uh, would much rather, uh, much rather uh, administer its own poverty program than, for instance, uh, give deductions to individual businesses or individual entrepreneurs who will take on the job of training somebody. They'd much rather keep somebody poor and take taxes from him, if only uh, to, uh, to give it back to that person after a whole series of tedious passages uh, through the bureaucracy. It strikes me as extraordinary that the same government that says anybody who makes less than $3,000 is poor taxes somebody who makes $3,000, $258 a year. What? So the, these, I think, are, are some of the paradoxes which uh, do suggest that there is a highly socialist bias in our present approach. To the First of all, I'm delighted to make a united front with you to advocate that mm -hmm. all people uh, classified as poor should be exempt from all taxes. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. Secondly, as I hope you do know from the Economic Opportunity Act, the government does have programs precisely providing loans for business if those businesses will hire people who are poor. Thirdly, as again, uh, as I just mentioned, uh, private industry uh, is in the poverty program. It has been farmed out uh, to corporations like Litton Industries, for example, as a piece of it. Uh, various uh, other businesses are in the poverty business. Finally, as a matter of fact, my objection to the poverty program, or one of my criticisms of it, supporting it as a start, uh, is that it is overemphasized local initiatives, that it has strewn the legislation with veto powers, that it is utterly localized and that the conservatives and the, generally the Republicans in Congress uh, hampered and paralyzed the program in part by refusing to give the authority mm. for some real comprehensive planning to Sergeant Schreiber. It does. It suffers to the extent that it is not sufficiently socialized in conception and administration, uh, as, far as, as far as you're concerned, and I see your point of view. But uh, for, for those of us who believe that uh, history shows that the most successful assault on poverty has precisely been conducted in this country. Uh, there are those who are concerned at the increasing centripetization of all of these functions in the hands of the government, and who also wonder uh, whether or not 
Uh, some of you, um, some of you uh, liberals, uh, oughtn't to concern yourselves a little bit more with the aridity uh, of the society that you are constructing. Because let's face it, uh, and let's now talk not macrocosmically, but in terms of uh, of actual people. Uh, there are there are, are people who are not poor at all. There are people in the University of California who lead miserable lives. There are there are people who, who who tolerate dirt and who tolerate rats because they haven't got the energy uh, to do something about it and don't care. Now something contributed uh, to the utter deracination of those people. Uh, something was responsible for their not developing an ethos. Uh, and and I, I suggest that it is unfortunately the case that the materialist orientation uh, of the poverty program is one that insufficiently takes these matters into account. And you may very well find uh, after you uh, after you have run out of any complaints about the nutritional dereliction uh, of any members of the American society that you will have walked into an unhappier society than ever existed before. Well, I'm sort of surprised uh, in the degree to which you're becoming a big government man. Uh, let me quote up. When did that happen? Well, you want me to concern myself with things, uh, intimate uh, alienation, psychological aspects. I don't have that idea of the range of government. I'm more for limited government. That is. No, I wasn't I suggesting this was that, the government's role at all. I believe that we can, in this society, we have the resources and the political and social techniques to do away with meals which are not nutritional enough, to do away with miserable housing, so forth. That I know we can do. That we can make man happy, I'm not about to guarantee at all. I think man has to make himself happy, although I think there are some things that we can begin to do now. For example, uh, I think that in a society that is obviously getting more and more leisure, we can provide socially and economically the resources, the, the parks, the playgrounds, the theaters, the painting materials, the teachers, uh, so that people can choose a productive and creative leisure. Excuse me, we have a cue. I'm, I'm sorry. <clears throat> Well, uh, uh, Mr. Harrington, I think that uh, just about everybody uh, does agree uh, that it, the, the problem of poverty is one that ought to be explicitly faced. The arguments have to do with whether or not a colossus that comes out of uh, Washington, D.C. with uh, an indistinct understanding of what are the principal ailments uh, of the community uh, is the way to go about it. Now you say that you, uh, although you don't particularly welcome the participation in the poverty program by private enterprises, uh, nevertheless there is a certain amount of that going on. Not nearly as much, I'm afraid, as you would suggest, as witness that no tax deductions, for instance, are allowed to businesses that currently take on the job of training people uh, who are, are previously unskilled. But uh, the the point I'm trying to make, uh, I gather, um, uh, ineffectively. Uh, is that one of the causes of poverty uh, is despair, uh, and that one of the causes of despair uh, is a general social condition, uh, which we know as the great malaise of the middle part of the 20th century, and that ironically, paradoxically, although we have more and more goods, and those goods are more and more widely distributed, uh, and uh, the, quote, poor in this country are minuscule, uh, by contrast with the poor of any other nation in the world. Even so, people are unhappier in greater numbers than they were before. And it's not only the poor, as I said before, it's the intellectuals, the University of California, uh, it's the rich, uh, uh, and it, it is others. Now, I am saying to you, is it possible that your particular pursuit of the poverty program precisely misses the main point? The main point being that we've got to rediscover the ethos for these people. Uh, and that under the circumstances, what they need to do is to be wedded more organically to their community, uh, reunited with the old uh, ideals, given back something of the old spiritual uh, energy which made life uh, worthwhile. Don't you suppose that there are an awful lot of people under the poverty program who really laugh uh, at your concern for them as really missing the point? There is a considerable literature of bitterness, precisely. Uh, on the part of these poverty people to those who think that they are really helping them by the kind of doses that you have been prescribing? Well, a couple of points. Uh, first of all, I don't think there's a federal <clears throat> colossus in the poverty program. 
Uh, as President Kennedy pointed out in his speech on economics at your alma mater, Yale, uh, in 1962, I believe it was, uh, actually, the federal government in terms of the American population has hardly been growing at all, whereas the enormous increase, 30, 40, 50, 60 percent, has been precisely at the grassroots, at the local level. I would point out, as a matter of fact, that the federal poverty program is almost all geared to that local level and to local administration. Secondly, I would question the implication of the fact that a program is in Washington, that this makes it somehow bureaucratic or anti-freedom. Because in point of fact, as we have discovered in the last two years, poor people in the United States tend to regard their bureaucratic enemy as the mayor right down at City Hall near them. And insofar as their freedom of choice has been somewhat modestly expanded in the community action program, it's been by Washington coming in, not as a bureaucracy taking freedom, but as an institution which is giving some leverage oh, against on, the local Michael, bureaucracy. Cut it out. That largely, largely has to do with a sheer, utter, total economic ignorance. Uh, if the average poor person in this country had any idea of how much money was coming out of his pocket to finance that great friend in Washington, there'd be a mutiny. Uh, look, in point of fact, you happen to believe in the metaphysics of big government. Uh, you, you have written, uh, when the people own the state uh, through political democracy, then public corporations are truly theirs, and nationalization is an instrument of freedom. Of course, the Tennessee straight Valley Authority out of the is an old, excellent, publicly, uh, democratically owned corporation. Well, it's, it's, it's straight, straight out of which the... Which the people uh, are not revolting against. Well, as a matter of fact, I, th I think uh, that if you look back on some of the exultant predictions of the socialists in the 20s and so on, who became the bores of the 40s and the 50s, you will find out that what you've just said now has been, been, been said now by all the people who who are interested in the dogmatical ejaculations of socialism. No, I, yeah. I, in, in point of fact, uh, Washington is, or can be, of course, a servant of any man, provided it's put to that person's use. No, I've, but I've, mostly what goes on uh, is the kind of thing that I finished describing a moment ago, namely that you on simultaneously, you tax John Jones uh, uh, so much that he comes down to the poverty level and you rush forward with transfusions of cash to him. And you get this kind of cir circumlocutory nonsense which bureaucrats thrive on and what you only get around to objecting to when you're actually faced with it, you say, sure, I'm all in favor of relieving those taxations. Why haven't you come out for that uh, publicly? Well, this, this is all uh, very metaphysical and facetious and, and, and interesting, but I, I'd like to talk about some facts. That in places like the Tennessee Valley... No, no, I, you, I, wait a minute, I didn't invite you here simply because you're for poverty. I invite you here because you're a very interesting person. Of course, and I'm now and, saying and that you, in terms you've of You've very widely on a number of subjects. In terms of public corporations, which you quoted from uh, the accidental century, Macmillan, uh, in uh, terms of uh, public, uh, <laughs> yes, indeed, uh, save me from poverty. In terms of public corporations, we have an excellent example of a public corporation in the United States, the Tennessee Valley Authority, which has manifestly benefited the people, which every politician and every citizen <laughs> almost in the area is for. Now, beyond that, of you... Of course it manifestly helps me if I take money from you and acquire it for myself. There's no reason, justification in the world for the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, to have had lavish uh, transfusions of cash uh, if, those, if, that, if those transfusions uh, had the effect of making people in, in Nebraska a, a poorer. The only problem with your economics is that it's you know, simply inaccurate. That is to say, the American economy is a national economy. An increase of buying power and well-being in the Tennessee Valley increases the ability of the Tennessee Valley to buy products from New York and Nebraska. We need, in some cases, yes. to take states like Mississippi, ruled by conservatives, and send some money in to raise their level up so that they can decently participate in the American economy and get over their Goldwater abstractions there. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Harrington, I know that your concern is greatly over other people's abstractions. Uh, and my, my whole point is that everybody's entitled to his abstractions. The difference between us being uh, that you like to uh, co-opt the federal government to beat me over the head on account of my abstractions, whereas I'm prepared to let you alone. Now, the Tennessee Valley Authority obviously is going to create cash. I defy even you to dump $3 billion in any uh, 40 square miles of the United States and not create something. But my only argument with the uh, mentality of the PVA is that there is, of course, no continuing justification uh, in its continuing to produce power uh, when it has uh, a whole series of immunities from federal taxation, when the effect of that uh, is obviously to tax people out over the country for the special privileges enjoyed by a few. Well, the problem yeah. is that the one thing, the thing that PBA does with it. All right, let's, uh, let's pause for a moment. Um, 
so I, I do want to uh, I, I do want to get through some some bigger you know chunks of this before we pause again. But uh, but this is uh, you know this is pretty amazing. Uh, so we, we should say like Buckley uh, has has made a bunch of interesting claims <coughs> about taxes, but uh, I, I really like you know I, I think Harrington actually responds in exactly the right way because. Uh, you know, Buckley is is talking in gigantic abstractions about taxes and uh, and big government and bureaucracy, and you know, people don't like being taxed to pay for good big government bureaucracy uh, without ever actually quite saying what he means. Like, okay, like like like, what are the things that we shouldn't have that we have? Um, and Arrington comes back and says, well, what about the uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority uh, and you know, like this seems to be an example of a big government program that that certainly helps people to, um, you know, to have better lives and 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 really much more um, ability to realize, you know, whatever they want to do with their life. Uh, isn't this a good thing? Uh, and and I think that the way that Buckley bites the bullet here is is pretty amazing, right? He says, "No, well, sure, you know, it's not right. Like that's like why should people." Why should people in other country, you know, parts of the country, you know, be taxed to uh, to pay for the Tennessee Valley Authority? So, uh, Rob, you want to you want to remind everybody, like, what what was the Tennessee Valley Authority set up to do? Yeah, well, it's uh, one of the very few examples we have in the U.S. of like large scale public capital and a public project uh, outside of the military research system, which has special status. They get mili- they get material resources rather than culture lectures. So there's sort of a separate realm. Yeah, TVA is a very effective rural electrification program and is part of, you know, previously quite poor portion of, of Tennessee. And uh, Buckley's claim is like, well, you've just taken money from us to the country to make something that's, you know, not very worthy. You know, oh, you made something, that's fine. Because in Buckley's mind, well, as he said, like you're just taking an average person taxing them to where they're poor and then use that tax money to give them services because Buckley doesn't understand economics. Like most conservatives, he just foresees a world where everyone is fairly wealthy like he was growing up. And so the only way there could be poor people is if they were taxed by someone so that we could have TVA and then you give that tax money to you know, someone in Tennessee or the benefits to that uh, to people who are local. And so it's this injustice and it shows uh, the terrible uh, uh, legacy of government action. Yeah. It's impressive because we have very few examples of this in the United States, but this kind of public capital is supposed to be what's like causing all the problems that we experience over mm-hmm. these last 40 wonderful years of uh, the age of Friedman and Buckley. Yeah, absolutely. And and again, like this is really worth with underlining these, these special privileges that, that people in the Tennessee Valley uh, are, are enjoying, uh, like our like access to electricity. Ooh, whoa. Uh, I guess you guys think you're royalty around here or something. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like, you, get to, you get to have power, you know, in, in your uh, in, in your farm. Yeah, uh, I, I doubt that Buckley thought growing up with electric heat in uh, New England's winters was a huge luxury for them. But uh, now and now that fancy electricity, these are poor people in the Hill Jacks, Appalachian states. This is big government. I don't like that. And you're right. This is how conservatives do it. They don't say we should cut taxes on Donald Trump so that we can get rid of Medicare or social security. Cause those are popular programs, you know, or the VA or something. So we'll say is we we're against big government. I don't want some big government. It's great. Cause most of these are like, a lot of this funding is for popular social service programs. I'm sick of big fire department. We should uh, get rid of them. It's big. I don't like that. Why is my house not getting yeah, put yeah. out when it's on fire? That's a weird mystery. Yeah, exactly. And, and it is, and it is like really worth underlining how weird that like, Oh, you've taxed people into poverty claim is like, cause especially thinking about that specific example. So like, um, would, uh, poor people in rural Tennessee, uh, if, if not for the, uh, the burden, uh, of, uh, of progressive taxation, you know, like, like have, have been living, you know, like, uh, like, yeah, to, you know, to make it personal, like Buckley's family did, you know, first in, uh, in Mexico. And then after, you know, some of their oil wells were nationalized in Mexico and new England, like that, that seems unlikely right <laughs> on the, uh, on the face of it. And it's yeah. also like, if anything is a, um, you know, is a public good, like, uh, you know, you think it would be electricity because, I mean, granted, uh, you know, there are people who, um, 
I mean, it's very rarely, I mean, honestly, you know, even most, even most like affluent people who've, you know, put a bunch of solar panels on their house or whatever, that doesn't actually mean that they're just, that they're generating all their own electricity, right? You know, they are using the, the publicly owned, you know, or unfortunately sometimes not publicly owned, you know, but yeah, the, uh, yeah, yeah. you know, they are, they are, they are using a larger grid, you know, that services lots of other people. Uh, and it's not, and this, I, you know, so like, is the idea uh, that uh, poor people in rural Tennessee, uh, if if not for the um, actually very small percentage of their their income that you know was going to the federal government, uh, that they that they would have just been able to to what like um, that they would have had their own like crowdsourced you know electrification program. Yeah, see, that's one thing I really do I really love about arguing with conservatives is because they'll say, well, if we hadn't done that. The you know the, the business community there would have said would have said well these people want electricity there's a demand for it I'll supply some and a market of supply and demand would manifest what people don't realize of course and this always amazes me like in economics we distinguish between demand which is people wanting you know resources and commodities so they can live and effective right. demand effective demand is dollars on the table if you're a hungry person you're like I'd really like food shut up you poor person go die right. in the snow if you're a poor person who wants ham and you've got 20 bucks okay well you've got effective demand that you can come on in poor people in poor areas you know pe business people will say there's no market for this these people can't pay for electricity what are you nuts i'm going to spend millions of dollars building a you know a, a power plant and all the expensive ass infrastructure and power lines and transformers and high tension cables oh my god why would I do that for these tiny returns? That's the reason why the government just passed more money for the program to give, I forget the name just now, the program to give high-speed broadband to rural communities, ones that aren't in the cities, kind of like where I'm at right now, where the internet is kind of on the edge of yeah. being uh, adequate for streaming. You know, It's because there's not enough people out here. They might even have money, but there's just not enough of them numerically. Like This is the issue with markets. You know, It's not just, well, people want something, They'll pay for it and the market will serve them. They might not. They might be poor. And maybe there's not enough of them. And that's a reason why you have to have either the government step in and, yeah, provide electric electrification uh, for this valley or provide internet service for people out in the middle of nowhere, Wyoming. It's because that market's not serving them because the demand's not there. But, you know, Buckley wouldn't recognize this because he did, doesn't understand the economics of that. And again, the economics of class itself. Like he said, you know, if you're just taxing people down to the poverty level, or as he said at the end there, if these poor people knew how much you're taxing them for welfare programs, they'd be going crazy. I think if they knew how much money Michael Bloomberg had, they'd go crazy. I think that's what's <laughs> going to incite anger among people more than like how much food stamps costs or something like that. Jefferson and Madison in their letters said like anger over the distribution of property is the main source of social strife. I think they're closer to it than Buckley was. Yeah, no, no question about that. And, and I mean, it's, and of course, um, people, you know, conservatives will try to get around, you know, the, uh, the upshot of this demand, effective demand distinction by saying, oh, well, and you saw a little bit, you know, he wasn't using the lingo, but you saw a little bit of this from Buckley that like, oh, well, sure, you know, they might say they, they, they'd like to be able to eat nutritious meals, but clearly their revealed yeah. preferences for, uh, you know, is, is for, you know, that nice new car that they bought instead, you know, so, so they don't really, uh, they don't really want it, uh, which. Oh, yeah, you know. that, that is a big piece of it to this day too. These people aren't poor. I saw someone using food stamps and they had a cell phone. Yeah. How poor can they possibly be? They had clothes on, so they aren't that poor. Yeah, I'm going exactly. to go tell my servant this story and they will have to laugh at it or I'll fire them. <laughs> yeah, 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 exactly. And of course, um, as Harrington points out, you do actually, especially if you uh, if you live out in a rural area where without public transportation, you know, you do really need a car. Uh, and, you know, Buckley sort of tried, okay, but a new car, which is great too, because what he wants people to do uh, is to um, buy a series of cars that, that have a bunch of problems that you're going to, uh, that you're going to need. Yes. To poor money into repairs out all the time which you know might in fact end up it's true end up costing you more you know in the long run than, than a uh, a modestly priced uh you know new new car in some cases 
uh, I mean, so it's it's both that it's some of it. This is just mythology. Obviously, this is the uh, you know this is the stuff that uh, Ronald Reagan based his political career on. You know, the uh, the wel- welfare queens and the uh, driving Cadillacs around the ghetto. Uh, but uh, so so some of it's just bullshit. But I mean, like, but there's also some of it that's like, oh, like when people actually are, <laughs> you know, are buying decent cars. Uh, now you're getting mad at them for actually making a you know like the financially wiser decision about what to do. Yeah, you know, it is more costly to be poor because you rent instead of getting a mortgage because you don't have the upfront payment. Yeah, you buy used goods instead of new ones because you can't afford the big upfront cost, you know, or you, you know, you borrow money for them, which of course costs you much more over time. People and this whole yeah, right wing mythology of what it is to be poor is amazing. It's just people who made bad choices. Why did they finance in that bad way? They just they just don't know how to use money. Yeah, like it's yeah, the yeah. most entitled clearly they, tunnel clearly vision. They should have just asked their fathers for the money. <laughs> Why didn't they just go to their wealthy uncle and kiss his ass? Like that's that's what I do. That works pretty good. They just didn't think of it, I guess. Yeah, so this is all pretty gross, and we probably at least should at least mention it is a big subject. We should at least mention that. Buckley getting to redefine socialism over Michael Harrington's head, which is good. What does Harrington know about it? Don't yeah, interrupt yeah, yeah, him. Yeah, yeah, sure you interrupt him so he can't tell you. It's old-fashioned to believe in worker control. These days, socialists believe in centralization. I'm no socialist, but I can tell you what they believe now, and I'll interrupt you so you can't get in your Yeah, yeah, you're going to have um, – I mean, in fact, as Buckley later acknowledged, right? I mean, Buckley wrote an obituary for uh, for Harrington when he died, where his little witticism was that Harrington was the um, most prominent socialist in the United States, which was a bit like being the tallest building in Wichita, Kansas, uh, which, you know, which is funny, but it's also like, okay, so um, the most prominent socialist in the United States is telling you what socialists think, uh, and you're saying, yeah, 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 but like, you know, I'm, I'm going to, I, I'm going to sit here as the editor of a conservative magazine and yeah, yes. tell you, you know, and tell you what I assume that socialists think. And, yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. Go I have conservatives that. on my show, but before I let them talk, I'll keep their mics off and tell you, here's the five fucked up things they want. So it's pretty goofy. And just to say like, that is a standard thing. The socialists want centralization because we like public programs. Conservatives love centralization for anything but helping the poor and redistributing oh, wealth. You know, and, and they love the they love the Pentagon. You know, they love the patriarch of the family. Like they're all about concentrating wealth and money. And we should mention too, in this era that Buckley waved the flag for of deregulating firms and markets and cutting back on antitrust, markets centralize over time for just straight economic reasons that we'll have to deal with under socialism too, like economies of scale. You don't make you know aluminum and cars and electricity in tiny plants like they're big fucking expensive crazy things governing them and funding them will be something that socialism has to cope with but in buckley's version because conservatives don't understand economics that well it's the market it's free and anyone can walk in anytime and compete it's so easy we have network effects you know you want one facebook you know and you have tiny numbers of firms like for phone operating systems for food processing medical devices before we made them illegal we had monopolies in oil steel and banking like that's as fundamental as it gets so all this like oh socialists want centralization we actually fucking still want worker control centralization through like a nationalization of an industry may play a role in getting to that point but never let some right-wing idiot you know dictate to you that this is what socialists want no we want worker control and if the economics of it mean we have one giant platform for search or for you know making medical platforms or whatever like that should be under worker control to decide what to do rather than some sleazy ceo who's only doing like meeting his near term uh, Wall Street profit projection for the share price. So just to make sure we should at least address that before we let no, Buckley no, get away sure. with smearing socialism from beyond the fucking grave. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. I mean, look, uh, I mean, Harrington kind of made this point in passing, you know, he was like, hey, I mean, you're, uh, you know, you're the the big government guy here, you know, like you, you, you think that we should be having a political argument about people's souls, you know, I mean, I, I, I just want them to have food and housing. Uh, oh, that is good. Yeah, that's not uh, bad. You know, which, which, which seems, which is, in fact, is exactly right. You know, because the kind of, um, I mean, that is exactly that merger of economic libertarianism and social conservatism that that Buckley helped midwife. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I totally agree. I think that uh, that centralization and decentralization are a second order question. You know, the the primary question is. Uh, 
you know, who controls, you know, the, uh, the means of production. And I think that you could have, you know, I think like a simple way that I've always used to, to sort of illustrate this distinction is, um, you know, Walmart has, I don't even remember some ungodly, a uh, number of, of 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 you know superstores in the United States. I used to know what the number was, but it's probably gotten bigger since I knew, uh, yeah. you know. But let's say like eight hundred, whatever it is, right? Let's let's say Walmart has eight hundred super centers in the United States. Um, if if that is the case, right? Like uh, whatever the real number is, but let's say eight hundred. Uh, okay, look. Uh, let's say that uh, there was some, you know, militant workers movement that got a bunch of people elected, right, you know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, uh, or, or whatever. Let's, let's even assume some, like, much more radical sudden break from the status quo than how we think it's probably going to happen. And, and, and let's say there's, like, this general breakdown of central authority and that you form, like, it's like the Paris Commune, you know, that there are, like... Yes that there are uh, that all of these different local jurisdictions in the United States just become like little freestanding socialist communes and each one of them expropriates its local Walmart. Uh, so um, what you have now uh, is a dramatic uh, decrease in centralization, but clearly on the capitalism versus socialism question, right. You know, like that, that would be a way that socialism, uh, involves a lot less centralization and letting, you know, and letting the Walton family own all 800 stores, it involves much more centralization. Uh, like, and, and so I, I think that, you know, how centralized or decentralized things are, it's not that it's not an important question. It is, you know, but it's, it's, it's just a second order thing. You know, the, uh, the, the, the question that matters for the capitalism socialism debates is not how, is not how centralized things are, but, you know, right whatever the units are, however large or small the economic units are, who's in charge of them. Yeah. That does fundamentally come down to the issue. Yeah. Of power and decision-making ability. And yeah, that's what we chop up a lot in the, uh, in the freedom book is, you know, we say we're more free when powerful institutions control you less. Sadly, it's not just the state that can do that. You know, it's certainly the business world, whether it's tech or banking yeah. or, you know, energy and also the church. Let's not forget that. Yeah. Buckley and, all these guys are very mad at the government for waging war on the church in schools. Why can't I make people read the Catholic version of the Ten Commandments uh, in <laughs> school? It's very frustrated about that. It's amazing how much, yeah, all this, all this cultural stuff and concern about centralization, it's only for left-wing projects that will help people or affect capitalism. As soon as it's back to like protecting my control over my wife and my company's control over my workers and our military's mm -hmm. control over Vietnam – I'm very excited about military materialism and centralization. Uh, it's just so naked. It's amazing how long these guys have been able to coast on their tired ass uh, uh, saws. Yeah, for sure. Uh, sure. Although it's immune Obviously, because it's, it's not tax. It's immune from the onerous uh, job of the double uh, bookkeeping because all of the profits of the TVA go to the federal government. It has no profit to go Why to the Why didn't anybody think of that before? It's a marvelous idea. You can eliminate bookkeeping completely idea. by simply having everything that goes to us go immediately to the federal government. And then from time to time, we can make our press on uh, 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 I think, I think to, to, to if it goes right become less of a debater and to try to really put a point on the table, uh, I don't have an ideological predilection for the federal government. In the poverty program. I believe that in the cities, the middle class in the post-war period has moved out, taking their taxes and leaving their problems. I believe that the major cities of America do not have the resources, therefore, the tax base, to deal with the poverty problems and the slum problems. I believe that the states, through the historic nomination of conservatives before reapportionment, defaulted. And it's not because I have some great predilection uh, for sending everything to Washington but because Washington is the only place where the resources and the directing intelligence to deal with problems that in a great many of instances are national economic problems. No, the trouble, Mr. Harrington, is that you tend to complicate the problem by uh, ado adopting a series of, po of, uh, of positions that increase rigidities, which otherwise would shake loose by the operation of the free enterprise system. The answer is that more people wouldn't come into the large cities uh, if it weren't that they are lured into the large cities by uh, sometimes highly profligate policies and sometimes by indirect subsidies of big business. Uh, if, in fact, uh, General Electric, let's say, uh, in the middle of Chicago uh, need, uh, uh, wants, uh, uh, wants to hire a, uh, 
a, a, a janitor at $50 a, a, a week, uh, that, that janitor is simply not going to be available unless he himself in his other capacities receives a whole series of free services, schools, hospitals, and the rest of it. So that there, is, there could even be an indirect uh, 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 subsidy to General Electric by the government in systems like this. But the free enterprise system says, uh, for heaven's sakes, let the deployment of people uh, be a function of the free market operation because that way, uh, in the last analysis, you will be adjusting the society more to the desires of the individuals. Otherwise, you're going to have some sort of a program after the next program after the next program on the basis of which you're going to be ending up carting people around whoever becomes convenient for that intelligence of yours that lives in Washington but, that you spoke about a moment ago, but to have them. Yeah, I, uh, several things, three quick things. Number one, uh, if the conservatively ruled states in the South would stop exporting their miseries, would stop simply uh, displacing people into this great free market, uh, that would alleviate some of the problem. If we could get some money into Mississippi, what I want to help what Mississippi. What do you mean exporting them? I mean Why, to say that, they that say you in, in Watts, a great deal of the problem were poor Southern Negroes who were in Southern states ruled by conservatives, driven off the land, what, what uh, you, had no way to earn their bread, came north not because they were lured by profligate welfare policies, but because they could not eat in Mississippi. Uh, and that if Ms. we could put some, have a Mississippi authority with some of my there, federal there, money. There is still another America for you to write a book about. And I'll nominate one in which you go down to the South and you will find out there isn't massive starvation in the South. Uh, people would be very, very surprised to find out that they go hungry in the South. This would be quite, come as quite a revelation to them. No, they go to Los Angeles for any number of reasons. Some that, uh, uh, some that you and I would approve of, some that we might disapprove of. Uh, but it is also true that they are being lured to certain places in large part by ideologists who want them there because they make for votes or because they make for cheap labor or, or for whatever reason. Could I, could I intrude? Uh, if you can do it in five seconds. I can't. <laughs> Excuse me. We'll be back in just a moment. Oh, uh, before we start back up again, of our studio. Um, I, I, I do want to just say, we'll, we'll watch the next segment, but, uh, but, uh, but I do, I do want to just say, uh, if people have questions, they'd like me and Rob to, uh, to answer at the end, uh, just, just drop it in a super chat and, uh, we'll, um, our producer Forrest will, uh, will, will read those out at the end. So I just want to remind people that, or if they came in late in the stream, didn't hear me say that earlier, but let's, let's watch the next uh, segment. The audience for our two debate participants. When your name is called, would you kindly just stand and read your question directed to either Mr. Buckley or Mr. Harrington. I'd like to suggest, too, that while the questions are directed to one participant, perhaps the other might have some interesting comment to pass along afterwards. Mr. Bert Eskold, please. Uh, political scientist. Uh, Mr. Harrington, given the uh, proposition that participation of the poor in making decisions uh, raise poverty programs is desirable, even essential, how can the necessary machinery for such participation uh, the liberation, debate, voting, etc., be set up in the beginning of the program in view of the general and understandable apathy of the chronically poor, especially regarding political matters. Well, I think uh, one should not expect a gigantic upsurge from poor people. They have been so beaten down, so disappointed that they're going to be wary. I think, as a matter of fact, far from being chagrined by the 5%, 4% participation that's been achieved in places like Philadelphia and other cities. I'm happy. That's a beginning. The mere fact that you have an election, you have a convention, uh, is the important thing. Finally, here, I think, is, is where the real problem is, is for the federal government, which in this sense, is, I think, is expanding freedom for individuals at the grassroots, not to let the city halls and the political leaders uh, get total control. I think that's why it's a, uh, it's a Buckleyite point that I will make here, that it's so important for the federal government to guarantee the grassroots participation, and, and that indeed it is Washington not City Hall, which at this point uh, represents that grassroots uh, participation. Mr. Buckley, do you have a comment? Well, we have a question directed to you, Mr. Buckley. Ms. M. Livingston, please. Uh, do you not think that poverty programs are corrupting because they stifle initiative and free enterprise? I think they can be. I think there's no question about it that um, although it's very unfashionable to talk about it, uh, some people are lazy. Uh, and um, uh, there, there is no question but that to, uh, uh, to uh, make 
laziness of profitable is, is corrupting. Now, I will grant that there are, there are the larger difficulties uh, and that under, under the circumstances of the larger difficulties, you sometimes have to neglect the latter difficulties. But I, I do very definitely agree uh, that uh, the old-fashioned vices still exist and that some of them are encouraged by indiscriminate welfareism. I believe Mr. Harrington has something in the nature of a Just rebuttal. Just one comment, not a complete rebuttal. I would only like to point out that about half of the poor people in the government's uh, statistics work full time. Uh, and about the other half are mostly people who can't, because of age or disability, work. And that therefore the problem of laziness uh, is really a minor problem. We have a question now from Mary R. McCarthy. I'm a retired teacher. This is addressed to Mr. Harrington. Do you believe that the anti-poverty funds really provide conditions that will help the poor to become self-sufficient rather than developing a dependence on government aid? Uh, given the fact that I have criticisms of the program, I think I'd like to emphasize that the approach being taken is precisely to this independence and self-dependency. Uh, the program is oriented towards making people able to take jobs. That's about half of it. The other half is community action where poor people themselves are invited to participate and encouraged to participate, at least in theory. So that I would say, and I know from my own uh, connection and uh, people in the program in Washington, that its emphasis is almost inordinately uh, on uh, self-dependence and making people able to function, rather, and in breaking, precisely in breaking welfare dependency. Mr. Buckley, you have anything to add or detract? No, only that uh, I wouldn't have expected uh, a different answer. I don't think anybody who's going to talk about the poverty program says, no, on the contrary, you want to keep people lazy. You don't you understand that's very important. Uh, the, 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 the obvious question is, is it, is it working? We don't know whether it's working. It'll take two or three years before, as Mr. Theodore White has said, we discover whether or not poverty programs have developed their own ethos. I very much fear that we will have discovered that they don't which is one of the reasons why I think that we should be more inventive and look for other means by which to stimulate the drive against poverty. We have a question now from Mr. Irv Fells, directed to Mr. Buckley. Buckley, yes, I'm self-employed. Now, do you, <clears throat> Mr. Buckley, really think that this poverty prob uh, program is being propagandized for the Democratic Party's political advantages or oh, disadvantages? Sure, sure, sure. sure. <laughs> There's no question about it. Uh, uh, practically every political program uh, is a program on which uh, there's going to be a lot of political profiteering. Mr. Richard Nixon came out a few days ago uh, and endorsed the recommendation by Senator Murphy to put the people who work in the federal poverty program under the provisions of the Hatch Act, i.e., to make it illegal for them uh, to, uh, well, to make politics on federal time, is what it amounts to. And I think that's a, a step in the right direction. Would you care to comment, Mr. Harrington? A quick one, which is uh, the Democratic Party has gotten some deserved credit for taking the leadership in this fight. However, it's, I think, a little more complicated than Mr. Buckley indicates, in that Democratic mayors have often been most vociferous in attacking the community action program. And in a sense, the Democratic leadership has financed some programs which is upsetting local Democrats in big cities throughout the United States. Mr. Harrington, I believe this next question is directed to you. It's from Mr. Stanley Klopotsky. Stan Klopotsky, I'm a teacher. And uh, part of my question was answered by your previous statement. But can you elaborate on the statement that you made about conservatively controlled states and cities before, when uh, the biggest states, or the biggest cities in the United States have been, the past 20 or 30 years, controlled by liberal Democrats, and the condition of the poor in those places has... Uh, consistently grown worse and not better. There's so much uh, to be said. Number one, quite often those Democrats are not liberal Democrats, but machine Democrats. Number two, uh, the problem that I indicated before was that the middle class has, is leaving the big cities of the United States, taking their taxes, leaving the poor behind. This is a situation in almost every big city. And even the best willed mayor in the world cannot solve that problem on his own resources. Uh, so, uh, uh, this is why the mayors have to look to Washington from the big cities, because they can't do it on their own. And by the way, one last point here, the conservative middle class or the middle class is now trying to continue this by putting a veto in the rent subsidy program that's now up before Congress. 
essentially to keep poor people out of the suburbs, to keep them locked back there in the city so that the problem will just feed upon itself. Mr. Buckley, I detect a desire to answer. Oh, well, one last point is that that was all nonsense. Or, or most <laughs> of it. The, the uh, New, New York City in its own taxes uh, pay, put up uh, $800 million more in 1965 than it had uh, uh, than it had at the beginning of Mr. Uh, at, at the beginning of the last term of Mr. Wagner. I'm not talking about federal money now. I'm talking about city money, uh, and so it goes. I think in Chicago and also in Los Angeles and also in Boston. I, I remember making a study of it uh, at the time of a brief uh, experience with municipal elections. But it is true that uh, uh, it, it is true that the resources are in a city. Uh, what what Mr. Harrington isn't really touching is, are the resources within the city to do absolutely anything at all? And the answer is no, but they aren't. Uh, because if the moment comes uh, when people have to subsidize everybody except for themselves, they're going to seek refuge somewhere else. The question, the, the most interesting question, which Mr. Harrington unfortunately doesn't analyze is, where are they going to find this kind of shelter? Uh, after we're through giving everything to the federal government, and having the federal government control us, could control the entire continental limits of the United States, where do you go to express your protest? This is one of the reasons why people are afraid of centralized programs of this sort. Were you mugging the sense? <laughs> I wasn't on camera. I wish I wish I would. <laughs> I, uh, I didn't note whether or not, uh, Mr. Harrington, you had some secondary comment to what Mr. Buckley said. Uh, well, one said. brief secondary comment that I, I sympathize profoundly with those who sit on their estates in Connecticut and tell us how the federal government is taking everything away and giving it to the poor. I simply say it's obvious to everybody who looks that not only are there poor people in the United States, but the rich are getting richer. They're not, they're really, uh, the luxury items are not doing badly. Do I understand that the 800,000 people who left New York in the last six years found themselves country estates in Connecticut? No, I was talking about one. <laughs> I guess I know you Gentlemen, I hadn't anticipated that we would have a debate on a single question on this program. <laughs> If you uh, will study my record, I left Connecticut to come into New York. I'm one of the few who reversed that. Day. I remember. <laughs> I have to a become very mayor. neglected Connecticut estate at this moment. Mr. Buckley, I believe the next question is directed to you from Howard Klein. Uh, I'm Howard Klein, physician. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm wondering about your neglect of the emotional and spiritual lethargy of the poor, which are such important uh, motivating factors. Uh, uh, for example, in seeking work and other uh, important uh, sociological implications. Well, I sought not to neglect it. Uh, I sought precisely not to neglect it by saying, I think, on three or four different occasions, that we may really find that this this is the root cause of human misery. I even quoted Paul Jacobs by saying that people in America are primarily psychologically pauperized rather than materially pauperized. And uh, I, I have maintained consistently that the federal government is uniquely not the instrument by which you try to inspire uh, a people uh, to, uh, to shake themselves out of that particular lethargy, and that under the circumstances to put all of our eggs in this poverty basket uh, is, uh, is extremely dangerous, precisely because the thing to keep one's eyes on is exactly the point you raised. Mr. Harrington, you have a choice. You can either rebut or you can wait for a next question, which is directed to do all of you, which must be done in one minute. Uh, well, go on. Uh, I would just uh, rebut by saying uh, that there is a profound psychological problem among the poor. That's one of the terrible things about being poor, but not having enough to eat, living in a miserable, miserable tenement in Harlem or in Watts, uh, not having a job, working all year and not being paid enough to support your family, these things, although they cause psychic misery, are not psychological, and these are the proper objects of federal and governmental policy. And I think if we get at them, then after people have something to eat, they can start to think about being happy. Gentlemen, we have concluded this question and answer period. We'll be back in a moment. Mr. Harrington, thank you very much for coming. You sometimes have a, a habit of suggesting that people who disagree with you are quotes waspish and callous, to use a phrase of yours. I appreciate you not having done that uh, to me. And uh, I do think that you make as eloquent a case for the policy program as any I've ever heard. Thank you. Very nice. Uh, yeah.
<laughs> yeah, the uh, the thing. Um, I, I think that was like that was that was well played, like in uh, in the Q and A um, when uh, when when Buckley was again being extraordinarily vague. Uh, was was painting this this dystopian picture of you know everything centralized in the hands of the federal government, uh, and and so you no longer, I mean the way he put it was you no longer have anywhere to to make your protest. But I, I, I guess what he meant was you don't have enough localized you know power for there to be a way to have citizens you know push back against federal policies you know at the local or state level. That's the closest I could get to making sense of that, uh, and. And I, I and I think that Harrington, you know, knew what he was doing. That that was like um, he had up till then heroically held back from from uh, from making references to this. But he that that's where he stuck in. Is uh, yes, I'm sure it's very difficult to live, you know, to live on a on a country estate in Connecticut uh, with your inherited wealth, and you know, and that the um, you know the federal government has really left you with nothing. You know, I see what the problem is. Yeah, that's uh, that's pretty great. You talk to conservatives, and yeah, a food stamps program, and like right around the corner is Joseph Stalin's boot on your wife's neck. Like it's just you, you put through this housing voucher program, and there will, you won't be allowed to protest even. Uh, it's pretty fucking hysterical. Yeah, uh, you yeah. know, and literally hysterical. Just like the most. Yeah. Uh, doom mongering you possibly get out of the mildest new deal programs and god can i just say too like watching that last segment before the q a too you know this show uh you know it reminds me of a great joke uh you know hey ben uh, uh knock knock who's there uh the interrupting william buckley <laughs> the interrupted william buckley don't you feel that the ethos of the poor is a psychic wound you see it's incredible like the psych again poor pe poor people are pr in america are primarily spiritually poor. That is just so true. Like that dust bowl. Oh yeah. God, the emotions that cause that dust bowl. It's like you guys are getting carried <laughs> away with negativity. It's so negative. You strip the soil off whole states. So much. It's like, it's like what's that stupid? Uh, the secret. Yeah. Like yeah. The se stupid self help books are so close to right wing economics. I think oh, I could probably get away with assigning them. Yeah, yeah, right. I mean, the uh, the secret. By the way, if people don't remember this, this is kind of a uh, a relic of the uh, the early two thousands. I think is when that was most popular. Maybe yeah. late. Anyway, whatever. Certainly, uh, certainly at least a decade and a half or so ago. Uh, but it was this immensely popular self help book, uh, which uh, had this weird like uh, it was like a actually in a way I kind of anticipated Jordan Peterson because it was like it was it was self help combined with uh, weird metaphysics uh, yeah. because in uh, in the secrets case it was based on the idea that it was this like spiritual truth that they tried to attribute to various sources you know the bible and other things again also also uh well anticipating although it already existed then uh but you know the expansion of the particular uh horror that's known as the prosperity gospel uh, you know, but but this was a, this was a much more like generic ecumenical version. You know, that was, you know, it was, it was sort of you know they they kind of did the Christian sources a little bit, but it was but it was at least as much pitched at, at the I'm spiritual but not religious crowd. Uh, but they said that like this basic principle of the universe uh, was what they called the law of attraction. Uh, so there's this analogy to, uh, to to magnetism, and and by the way, my favorite thing about it was always that it shows this misunderstanding of like what any fifth grader who's paying attention knows about how magnets work, uh, which is that because this law of attraction that was supposed to be like magnetism was that like attracts like, and of course that would be the exact opposite of how magnetic poles work, but whatever. Yeah. Um, it's opposites <laughs> attract in magnetism yeah, exactly. and, and in love. It's a two things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There you go. Uh, and, um, and so uh, there was, um, and so they said that basically like what happens to you and, and how prosperous you are and how well your life goes depends on what energy you're putting out into the universe. You know, that, that negative energy will, will attract negative outcomes and positive energy uh, will, um, will, uh, will attract um, 
uh, positive outcomes, you know, which, which my response to is always, it's like, you know, Oh my God, I, I wonder what horrible, you know, what horrible psychic energy, all those poor people in Hiroshima were putting out, you know, that day in 1945. Yeah, you know, if, if all those European Jews had just had happier thoughts, perhaps the Holocaust would not have happened. What a dumb remark that is. But if you, if you know, if you like the world of the secret, any, but again, though, that's just so close to what he's saying. It's my God. Oh, if, yeah. if, these, if these poor people would just go to Catholic mass more, they'd, they'd complain less and maybe get richer. Possibly. Yeah, right. Well, I mean, he, no. he did, he did literally suggest at a couple points that, uh, that like despair, you know, spiritual, you know, lack, whatever was the cause uh, of of poverty, which which is just remarkable, right? Because especially, yeah. especially since he also this is the same guy who says uh, that uh, that we were all like spiritually much better off, you know, in uh, in the past, and and so it's like hold hold on, right? Like because that there is maybe not an outright contradiction, but certainly a tension here between saying that. Um, it's the uh, the cultural and spiritual issues that are causing the poverty, uh, but also the cultural and spiritual stuff used to be way worse, and also the poverty used to be way worse because capitalism has developed the world. Oh, so yeah. it's kind of seems like something has to go here. It's a uh, mess. Yeah, it is a weird mess. Like it's like okay, well, hold on. Like what? Like I mean, go back to your original thing. You know that you're that you're trying to give Harrington a hard time about about the, at the beginning of the debate about how oh. Uh, you know, the people, poor people in the United States are so much better off than poor people in, you know, immediately post-colonial India, that people uh, that, you know, poor people now are so much better off, as Harrington said, making fun of, but I think also justly representing his position, you know, that poor people today are so much better off than, you know, medieval peasants. Um, true, but hold on, like, surely the medieval peasants problem, you know, wasn't, uh, wasn't that they, they didn't have, you know, Buckley's spiritual values. Yeah, that's you know they were filled of of the Catholic Church and beard like everything that yeah, you would yeah. argue for like the, those classic masses. Yeah, exactly. They were all going to mass, right? You know, that's, that that clearly wasn't the problem. Yeah, and you know, yes, like that's pretty gross too. But also, again, I, in a way, I'm finding I almost prefer this era of right wing debate because there there is there is more earnestness than there is now. You know, we're against these programs. We don't want people voting in general. You're not smart enough. Everyone should have to pass a literacy test. But also, the uh, you know people are lazy. Like that's like that is on right wing media now. Like you do, you will see that on Fox. Like all oh, these lazy people on welfare. But like it's a it's less foreground now. Just to say, some people are lazy. Some people are underclass who deserve our contempt, and we step on their faces. That's yeah. It's, it, I like I like it when he just puts it out there. Like you people shouldn't vote. You're stupid and lazy. Like what happened to this earnest, open elitism. Like I really miss that era where we didn't have to pretend that Reagan and Trump are men of the people and all this like wretched <laughs> yeah. bullshit. I prefer this. I like this better. You know, people people are lazy. Like all these slaves I have, they're so lazy. Good thing I enslaved them to get them to work. Like it's <laughs> right, such a right, digital, exactly. evil oh, well, autocratic well, argument that it just it yeah it which, brightens, which, which it you brightens you my exactly. arguing with conservatives' heart to hear it. Exactly, which is exactly what he's arguing there when he brings up the laziness that, uh, that oh, if you just, you know, um, the problem with these anti-poverty programs is that people will be, you know, less reliant on their employers uh, and uh, and that'll make them lazy, um, you know, which is, so it's, it's, it's pretty openly a social control thing. It's also obviously absurd for the more obvious, you know, more uh, straightforward reasons that Harrington said uh, that... Um, you know that that so many of so many people who are living in poverty have jobs, uh, and and so many of the people who are living in poverty who don't have jobs can't have jobs for for various reasons. Uh, you know, ranging from uh, having yeah. you know like ranging from being taken care of you know from taking care of young children uh, to uh, to perhaps uh, having uh, become disabled. You know, fighting uh, one of the awful colonial wars that William F. Buckley was so enthusiastic about. Yeah, or getting your back broken in a coal mine because William F. Buckley refused to support expanding OSHA into the mines for years. Uh, yeah, like it, this, half of these things are side effects of your precious system, Buckley. It seems yeah. it's, it's just, it's just yeah. irresponsible to ignore it. Yeah, for sure. Um, you know, that there's a great uh, Sturgill Simpson song called uh, King Coal uh, where he's, he's, both, um, uh, he's both bemoaning, you know, all of the 
uh, horrible things that have happened since the, the coal mines closed and the devastating economic effect that, that had on those communities, but he's also sort of in passing saying like, you know, oh, my life is, you know, my life is going to be pointless and empty and, and I'm just going to turn to drugs and all this stuff because, you know, because of the economic problems. Uh, but also I'm going to be the first person in like four generations, the men in my family who haven't died of black lung, uh, you know, so like that's, it's a, you know, there's a, you know, like it's, and, and certainly, yeah, like, I mean, those, those kinds of things like OSHA, you know, that's exactly the kind of uh, intrusive federal government program uh, that, that, um, that, that Buckley is, is vague posting about and in, uh, in those remarks about, you know, how nobody will be, um, you know, how it's gonna, yeah. How where there's the slippery slope from, uh, as you said, from food stamps to Stalin, uh, and uh, and it's also actually worth pointing out that uh, that again the very same William F. Buckley who's who's saying that oh um, anything that anything that expands the size of federal government even in the sense of it even in the sense at issue here which is expanding the size of what people can demand the federal government provide for them you know, as far as their material needs. Uh, is is therefore expanding centralization and is therefore bad for freedom, blah, blah, blah. Uh, this is the same Buckley who, in when he wrote his first book, God and Man at Yale, said, uh, oh, isn't it great that, you know, Yale's a private university, so we can just fire, you know, like if we wanted to, we can just fire all these atheist and socialist professors without there being any constitutional, you know, objection to that. So when he when it was convenient to his argument, he knew goddamn well uh, that uh, that private employers, you know, uh, that that people who work for private uh, private organ companies, uh, you know, don't have uh, the same uh, free speech protections, for example, uh, that uh, that people who work uh, for the federal government are at least theoretically supposed to have. Yeah, it is stunning. Yeah, I mean that is that is that book's argument is you know, like look at the, this professor's not even socialist professor's like not condemning socialism adequately. For my taste, so this guy's maybe a closet atheist. They shall be fired and lose their jobs. Well, we're going to give food stamps to people. What happened to freedom and letting the other guy? What happened to let it, let it live and let it live? It's just like this. I mean, that's the thing about partisan thinking. You know, you have no actual intellectual standards. It's well, all purely yeah. I, I, scenario at based. Best, at, like at best, you know, it's it's just that the consistent standard is that when he talks about freedom, he's really just talking about. You know, I mean, he's really just talking about the freedom of of you know people who um, who have, and actually, this is consistent around a lot of his politics. You know, both the workplace issues that we're talking about, but also uh, re the Baldwin debate. You know, his his early opposition to uh, the civil rights movement, uh, and and you know, this came up in this debate too. You know, his uh, his his strong, you know, his opposition to you know the federal government. You know, telling you know more local units of government what to do. And it's like, it really seems like a lot of it, whether it's General Electric uh, deciding, you know, what happens to its employees or, you know, Bull Connor deciding, you know, uh, you know, what black people are allowed to do, you know, and, um, you know, in, in, in like his, his local area uh, is just people, you know, like these petty tyrants, you know, treating other human beings like, um, you know, bugs trapped in jars, you know, and so like really what freedom means in this context is that you know you can do what you want you know within your own jar? Yes, uh, it's like Corey Robbins says. Like that is the, that's 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 a good maybe conclusion. Like that's what Corey Robbins said. Conservatism is is just defending traditional centers of power. And you know, so we'll we'll support the government if it's killing the Vietnamese to stop them from threatening com- traditional French colonial power. And you know, we'll oppose the federal government if it's going to let my wife have birth control or give my workers unemployment insurance, which weakens my power over them. I say the consistency is there if you look at it from the power of the point of view of uh, uh, power centers. Yeah, I guess you're right. Yeah. All right, Forrest. I think we uh, I think we had a couple of a uh, couple of super chats uh, that that I saw go by at various points. Uh, you want to uh, yeah. on? hold on? Had one a few minutes ago. Um, question: Is Buckley the reason or Sal guide why libertarians talk like that? Also, wasn't he Friedman and Hayek more theologians than uh, economists? <laughs> So I laughed through the second part. Uh, I, there's no justification for how conservatives talk, but I missed the second bit. I'm sorry. Oh, oh, right on. Yeah. Yeah, you know, it's true. And that is one of the great things is watching people, yeah, who you know, supposedly have this big grounding in their usually christian faith, which is very, you know, Jesus condemning the rich and urging communism on his followers, you know, give up your possessions and stuff. And then saying, oh, but I also support 
you know, I also support the Fortune 500 and the prosperity gospel that Ben brought up earlier, you know. Uh, yeah, it's amazing. But that was a big project, you know, like at this time and then especially like in the 70s and 80s. Guys like, uh, what's his name, Novak, uh, he was all about like, well, really, Jesus wants you to support Ayn Rand capitalism, which is just mind bending. I mean, like if you're going to be a crazy theocrat or a crazy libertarian, at least pick one awful ideology to have, like smushing Jesus and capitalism together like yeah, that. Right. I can't see it. So, yeah, at least Buckley, you know, that puts him below Friedman in that way. Yeah, yeah. The combination of, of Jesus and uh, Gordon Gecko is particularly unappetizing. Yeah. Uh, like and, and and it's and the Ayn Rand stuff is bizarre, right? Like like uh, that somehow Glenn Beck is both an extremely pious Mormon, supposedly, uh, but also a huge fan of Ayn Rand, who at least Ayn Rand was um was was self aware and consistent enough to to know that what she was glorifying uh, you know, completely flew in the face of traditional Christian values. Yeah. And, and, and she made a big point of it. She was like, yeah, you know, Christianity is, is a big part of the problem. It's teaching people to be self-sacrificing. I don't want them to be self-sacrificing. I, I, I like selfishness. So obviously I hate Christianity, uh, you know, which, and so like, there's something very like, like, I guess there's something particularly horrifying to me as somebody, you know, since, since like, okay, look, um, I am an atheist, and since I'm a philosophy nerd, I'm I'm perfectly happy to argue about that. But also, uh, since I have a sense of perspective, you know, I know that I have way more in common with, um, you know, with uh, with with Christian, you know, leftists than uh, than um, than with the uh, the Ayn Rands and you know and 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 your your you know latter day you know uh, libertarian atheist sociopaths uh, that uh, that you know that I'm, I'm I'm much um it's like you know I was, I was talking about this we did the last hitchin stream uh that uh there's a uh, there's a song uh called uh white wine in the sun you know which is like a secularist holiday song it's like a fun song but uh there's uh but there's this line in there at the beginning about uh you know I like the song overall but there's this line in there at the beginning about how uh the um how I'd rather break bread with Richard Dawkins than Desmond Tutu. And I was like, what, what the hell's wrong with you? Of course, of well, course, you should prefer well, to, you know, to Dawkins, like in every way, you know, you know. Let, let's like, not get carried away. Yes. That's yeah, uh, yeah. I'm I'm glad you're letting the church not control your mind anymore, but that's like Yeah, yeah. You like, like 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 you should prefer the guy who like heroically faced down apartheid to the biologist yeah. who says dumb shit on Twitter. Uh, but uh, yeah. but like then it's like particularly bad from my point of view it's like it's it's like particularly like just grotesque when people do the prosperity gospel thing it's like okay so like so so you get to have the the like irrational view about the nature of reality but like also combine it with the most horrifying possible negation of like the good parts about christian values yeah, exactly. So the questioner is right. Friedman and Hayek are better than Buckley, at least in that way. They they deserve that tiny amount of credit. Yeah, yeah. And and, and I should say, I mean, like I also suspect that some of what the questioner is getting at is is this um like what he says, like theologians, you know, more than 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 econ, you know, guys. Like I think I think some of what he's getting at is just the idea that um that a lot of what these people are selling, uh, and and this this really gets into your wheelhouse, Rob, is is not like, is not something that they've derived from some sort of empirical study of how economies actually worked. Uh, it's it's just it's just all based on on first premises, you know, like there's this kinds of like articles of faith about how market economies are theoretically supposed to work under idealized circumstances. Um, you know, so, uh, and, and I think, you know, I think that that applies to, you know, I think that applies to all of the above because, because clearly like, you know, look, I mean, if you want to say, okay, Ben, Rob, Forrest, you know, you guys are wrong because, um, you know, you're advocating, you know, a completely new economic system based on workers control and everything. And that would be bad for reasons X, Y, and Z, you know, we can have that argument, right? Like I can understand how, how somebody who, who, you know, is at least living in the real world could like disagree with me about that. But like when you start talking about this, like, oh, you know, we should have, 
you know, we shouldn't even have a Tennessee Valley Authority. You know, we should we should just have you know we should just have laissez faire. You know, and everything will work out well. It's like, well, come on, guys. I mean, like, like I I think I think that the I think the evidence is kind of in about that already. Yeah, it takes a lot of assumptions to make that model so pretty, and yeah, you don't usually get to live by them. Yeah. Okay, so um, another one. Uh, freedom to conservatives is just a fancy word for being at the mercy of the status quo, it seems to me. True freedom is having material needs, Matt. Yeah, right on. So that is, yeah, that's a lot of what the, uh, that side, that's a lot of what that book is about. Yeah, it's just, you know, what is freedom and the usual version you get from the right. And they're very proud about this. This is, certainly includes Buckley, is freedom from being told what to do by the government. You know, so you have positive, you have what they call negative freedom. You're freed from someone coercing you. You pick what tie to wear and what job to have. That's very nice. But of course, in reality, like we were, like uh, Harrington was saying, like if you've got, you would judge poverty relative to what the society can produce. And so if we're totally able to give everyone health care, which of course is the case in the US, we have a $20 trillion economy. We are able to give you health insurance. It is materially the case, uh, but we fucking won't do it because you don't have the effective demand. You don't have a job that's getting you insured or you can't afford to pay the insane out of pocket costs to just straight up buy a policy. So if you, had a, if you were supposed to be free to have health care, since society is able to provide that to everyone, that's called positive freedom, or sometimes people will talk about positive liberties or positive rights. Uh, and that's something that Buckley and Friedman will tell you is terrible and you don't want that. That's how people get entitled and reliant on the state. And soon they have psychic poverty because they think that you can fix problems with government, which is terrible. So it's true. And actually, this also connects to something Ben was saying, like to Buckley, freedom is, you know, the freedom of people of his class to do right. what they always do and exercise power over their employees and stuff. But they actually have a term from that that, I've, that I at least have seen you as, you know, hegemonic freedom. Where it's, you know, how can you take away my slaves? I should be free to be able to buy people and sell their children for money. What about my freedom to own people? Well, your freedom is power over these poor slaves you're buying. So it's not really your freedom. It's power you're exerting. So it's like hegemonic freedom. Uh, yeah, the, that's a completely reasonable question. Like maintaining that status quo is what freedom is to them. Negative freedom for them, no positive freedom for you because that would cost them money. That's a very perceptive question. Yeah, yeah, that's that's totally right. I should say, by the way, uh, there's a podcast that I, I listen to. Uh, it's a history podcast called The Age of Napoleon, and they, they just did an episode about the um, Haitian Revolution uh, called The Age of Toussaint. And uh, the, the Haitian Revolution, by the way, I think for all sorts of reasons, could be a much longer discussion, something everybody with, uh, you know, uh, lefty uh, inclinations, you know, I, I think should... Uh, you know, should look into right. We tend to know France and Russia much more than we know Haiti. But uh, but uh, as uh, as uh, uh, Slavoj Žižek, you know, likes to say, uh, you know, I think the you know the ultimate like you know the like the most important liberatory you know aspect of the French Revolution is is that it indirectly sparked you know the Haitian Revolution. Uh, you know, even though Napoleon then you know tried to uh, crush it, and um, and in this episode, you know, they're talking about in the early phases of the Haitian Revolution. Uh, the, um, you know, in the terminology of the time, you know, the big whites, you know, i.e., you know, the, the large planter uh, in, in Haiti, um, you know, there were also, you know, the, the small whites who are, you know, who are uh, uh, white, you know, uh, you know, French people who lived in Haiti, but, you know, didn't own plantations. And, uh, and uh, there were also, you know, mixed race people who owned their own slaves, etc. But, you know, the big whites were the socially dominant group. And you'd expect that when the French Revolution happened, they'd be horrified by it. But actually, they were all for it because they they identified with it. They, you know, because they had all their complaints about the French, you know, colonial authorities. In fact, and one of those complaints was, in fact, uh, you know, besides the fact, of course, they thought they should be able to elect people to the National Assembly. They didn't even want to have, like, mixed race planters be elected to it. But they thought they should be able to have people elected to it. Uh, but also one of their complaints was that every now and again, the royal authorities would, uh, would, would start to feel guilty about just how grotesque and horrifying slavery was as it manifested in Haiti and try to have some sort of half-assed toothless reforms. And, mm. and, and that they saw as a major infringement, you know, on their freedom, which I mean, of course, the same deal with, uh, you know, states rights and, you know, in the United States and, you know, the 1860s. Uh, and I, and I think that a lot of, you know, again, there is that conception of freedom that's just like freedom from the perspective of certain class of the population to just do whatever it wants, you know, uh, with, with no 
interference from um, from government or from uh, sufficiently organized people at the bottom of society, as in labor unions. Uh, but I also want to just to just to add on to what Rob said uh, because I, I could see somebody listening to this, you know, who might think, you know, somebody who hasn't been, uh, at, you know, has, uh, you know, is is uh, socialism curious enough to uh, to watch this channel, but you know, but might not be totally on board, uh, might hear that and say, well, what do you mean, like positive freedom? Like I could see that it'd be nice to have healthcare, but you know, what you know, what does that have to do with freedom? Uh, and I think there are a couple things you can say about this, but just for the sake of being succinct, I'll just say one of them, uh, which gets into what's sometimes called the Republican theory of liberty, uh, Republic, small R Republican, like Roman Republic, not like uh, the unsavory contemporary political organization, uh, yeah. is um, which says that freedom is best understood not as non-interference, you know, which is what which is what those libertarian and conservative accounts of freedom you know really focus on. Uh, in some contexts, uh, but as uh, non-domination. Uh, so, uh, you know, interference can be very objectionable depending on what kind of interference we're talking about. But the, the more fundamental problem is, is domination. And when you don't have healthcare, when you don't have housing, when you don't have all these things, then you're more susceptible uh, to unjust and unreasonable forms of, of domination because like the really concrete example we were talking about earlier, right? Why is it? that Ruther's attempt to, you know, to kind of trick uh, General Motors into supporting universal health care, you know, by saddling with them with health insurance costs. Why isn't it? Why is it that, that gambit didn't pay off? Uh, because they knew that they, they, if they had something over people because they were providing their health care, you know, that, that that would give them less rebellious uh, employees. And, and, and so I, I think the point goes, up and down the line for everything from uh, from housing and healthcare up to workers' control of the means of production, uh, that you know that I, I think that if the kind of freedom that we care most about, and I think intuitively this is what most people do care the most about, is freedom to live your life how you want to. To uh, you know, if you want to be what William F. Buckley wants you to be, right, and and you want to you know go to uh, you know go to five a.m. mass every day and and you know. Uh, and 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 do housework and you know and 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 never smoke pot and you know whatever, okay, do that, right? If you if you have different ideas about how your wildlife wants to what's go do that, but you know you're most um, like you have much more ability in practice to decide how you want to live your life uh, if you have the uh if you have the financial resources to you know to uh to strike out on your own to quit jobs you hate to you know to have uh to to leave you know to leave horrible marriages and you know there are people who stay in bad or even abusive marriages because they don't want to lose their house spousal health insurance you know that that is a real thing um and and you have you know people talk about oh you're, you're going to be dependent on the federal government but thing is Unless you're going to live out in a, in a shack in the woods like the Unabomber, and maybe even in some ways, then you are going to be dependent on other people to meet, you know, to meet your material needs. There's no getting around that, right? Like, like you're not like unless you're going to be like an individual hunter gatherer, you know, like the, you know, I mean, even the Unabomber probably bicycled into the grow, you know, the grocery store, you know, every now and again. Like, unless unless you're going to be an individual hunter gatherer, you are going to be reliant on other people to get the things that you need to, to live your life. The question is, who are you going to be reliant on? Under what rules? Under what circumstances? And uh, I'd, I'd say that being reliant on an organization that, A, you have some degree of democratic control over, uh, and B, that, you know, like you have legal institutions obligating them to provide you with certain things. You know, there is no there is no one who works for the NHS who's empowered to just say, oh, you know, John Smith in Birmingham, you know, doesn't, doesn't get to go to the hospital anymore. Right. Uh, like, like, the, like it's, it's, it's a, it's a legally mandated thing. So I'd say that's a much less extreme. You're not reliant on the whims of other people in the way that you are. If you're reliant on for your material needs on your employer or your spouse, or, you know, any of these other sort of uh, petty relationships of power that, you know, the William F. Buckley's of the world are going to defend in the name of freedom. I was uh I was reading like to your to your Haitian comments. I was reading uh the Black Jacobins by C L R James, great book. Somewhere, and they were talking about um groups of I think both white and uh some some of the non non slave like mulatto yeah. uh, 
groups of, of people in Haiti running around, um, like basically like LARPing the French Revolution in Haiti. <laughs> um, yeah, yeah, the, 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 like the, yeah, you're like waving around the tricolor for, you know, flag and you know yelling about liberty while literally like probably within a mile away, you know, one of the human beings that you own is like losing their arm, you know, to like harvesting sugar for you against their will. Yeah. yeah. Um, all right, so I don't see more super chat questions right now. Yeah, I, I think there were two earlier. Uh, I, I... Yeah, the, the two earlier. One was a book suggestion. It's back up far enough that it's not um, okay. showing it to me. The, the other one was something like, um, at this point, smartphones are are a necessity, which I think is yeah, yeah. I mean, it's 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 very closely parallel to uh, to Harrington's point about cars and rural areas. Yeah. yeah. Um, the like. Yeah, okay, sure. You can say that it's like something nice you're buying for yourself, but like good luck navigating a very long list of things in the world that we've created in 2020 without having one of those goddamn phones. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we you apply to jobs through it, you pay bills through it, you go on dates through that shit now. Like it's people yeah, and, and conservatives are like, oh, suppose next it'll be smartphones for all. Like, well, yeah, you know, we can provide them for everyone for all their essential tools. You shift for brains right winger. Like, yeah, like that's the type of thing because we can easily provide it to everyone. We should consider making that something that people have a positive liberty to. Like, you could at yeah. least argue it. I totally. mean, also, also the point about it being more expensive at this point to be poor, uh, you know, not having a smartphone sets you back a whole lot right now. And I mean, like, life is like, like even, even if you're, even if you're unemployed and even if you're broke, like, life is a lot easier if you have a phone plan and, can kind of be able to apply for jobs through it or, you know, even network through it. Yeah, yeah, totally. Um, and, and by the way, I saw somebody was asking about uh, white flight uh, and, and yeah, that was definitely already going on by the sixties. In fact, even slightly earlier, uh, basically the, the creation of, of the first big suburbs, you know, happened pretty soon after world war two. And especially in fact, enabled by federal government spending, you know, because of uh, highways, uh, that you know that made it easier to uh, you know to commute to work, uh, so that was definitely going on by then. And like a lot of those dynamics, like what they were talking, their the references they were making to lots, you know, like those that was, you know, that those those issues. Obviously, it wasn't as far along, but that was that was a big thing uh, going on uh, going on back then. And yeah, it's also it's like yeah, sure you could say oh next, like you're saying for us, yeah, sure next it'll be smartphones. You know, it's like yeah, okay, um, like. Yes, sure. But again, that goes back to Rob's point that as the capacity of a society to support people, you know, in more in more ways and at a higher standard of living increases, then sure, once reasonable demand increases too. Uh, but the same is true for, I mean, look, the same is true for lots of things like, um, and I mean, a, a sufficiently hardcore libertarian would just bite these bullets. But I mean, I, th I think it's, it's worth thinking about things that might even be in kind of the gray zone between positive and negative uh, liberties, like um, the right to a fair trial, right? Like, okay, everybody would nod along to that. Sure, you know, every right to a fair trial, but look, what a right to a fair trial means in 2020 is very different from what it meant in 1920. Uh, for one thing, uh, you know, like part of what we would consider to, to fall under that category, uh, you know, of, of getting a fair trial in 2020 is like your your defense team, you know, having access to, you know, DNA evidence and, you know, the laboratory equipment to, you know, do their own testing and, you know, things like that, you know, none of which was, was imagined, you know, by anybody in, in 1920, but I don't think that that makes it unreasonable that that's part of what goes into our, our current conception of a right to a fair trial. And it's certainly not unreasonable to think that like part of providing people with a decent life is that they can have a smartphone, which again is just a basic necessity for navigating through the world as it exists in 2020, which is set up at every turn on the assumption that people have those phones. And also, I mean, for God's sake, like, uh, I mean, we kind of forget, right? This is, um, you know, Zizek's point about uh, the, uh, uh, you know, about what's left out, you know, of, of, dis, of uh, you know, labor theory value that, uh, that, I mean, like, Apple, um, of course, you know, their, their wealth is in some sense created, you know, by the workforce, but like, really like what's inflating it is, uh, is, I mean, it's, it's all IP. I mean, like, there's no, like, like the actual, that the actual iPhone costs like nothing, you know I mean? Like the, the, uh, the, 
like the the actual like you know plastic and metal in this thing you know the the cost of producing it i mean especially where it's produced and you know free trade zones in china but even apart from that like the cost of producing it is is a hilariously tiny fraction of the price you know what allows them to charge what they charge for it is the intellectual property yeah and that kind of gets to the same point as the uh like i think a couple of years ago they they approved the planned obsolescence part of the uh of the iphones which apple has the apple is basically just charging for software at this point so they they basically plan that their phones are going to become obsolete in a couple of years not because they necessarily want you to buy new phones because of the hardware itself but because the software is the biggest uh money like the big money maker they have so they plan so that in a couple of years the software isn't going to work anymore on whatever phone you bought mm -hmm. um a question that oh you, you oh. want to say something to that as to say yeah like it, it is impressive though like when you would you see people the conservatives always saying like they're using food stamps but they've got a phone so the government just gives people money they've got a phone they, they can't be that poor like it's a necessity you fool like poor people have shitty old phones they have shitty old cars that's what this we were discussing that's what that's what's within their like limited economic horizons but it really gets to me too like the states in the u.s you know have some some autonomy over like food stamps and right. the Congress is always putting new restrictions on them too. And so like here in Washington state, if you go to the grocery store and you look at, you know, the prices of items on shelves, you know, this price and this price, some of them will have a second price. It'll say EBT eligible. Like this is something you're allowed to spend your food stamps on. And because we don't just let them spend it on anything because they'll spend it on small pleasures like cigarettes or fun food, like junk food. So let's control them more and make sure they can only buy certain things. Like there really is, a like don't merely preserve my power and wealth by not taxing me but also like the poor like they should be having shitty lives like they shouldn't be getting phones and being able to drive like they're poor they should be suffering so that they're motivated to be poor less like there's is to like a lot of this is defending power and the hegemonic freedom of the rich but i would also say like part of it is like well we're better than these poor people I don't want them. I don't want to see them not suffering. If I see them, they should be having a shitty time, like some hobo. You know, I don't want to see them playing a fun app on their phone. That's not satisfying to me. There is a little bit of that, like demonic nature yeah. to some of these people. Oh, totally. Yeah, and, and you know, credit where credits due. I mean, like, I, I don't like his overall politics, but you know, he he did make good points about things like this sometimes. I remember John Stewart? You know, he was, uh, you know, back when the Daily Show was still occasionally funny. Uh, was had. Um, had this whole thing where he was playing, you know, a segment where he's playing all these clips of conservatives talking about food stamps and, you know, and some of them they're complaining about like the luxury, you know, it's like, oh my God, you know, they're eating lobster, you know, they're buying lobster with food stamps. And then in others, they're complaining that it's that being about poor people buying cheap junk food with food stamps, you know, it's like, oh, look at how gross and unhealthy this diet is. Like, okay, well, yeah, I mean, like, you know, you like what would count as just, you know, like the exact diet that you're supposed to have if yeah. you're a SNAP recipient, you know, uh, to, to satisfy these ghouls is just amazing. But what I thought you were going to say, Rob, but if you do, if you won't say it, I will, uh, is, uh, is for, for more on what we were talking about regarding, uh, the practices of the tech companies, uh, you know, uh, read the, uh, the book, uh, that you can see to, uh, well on the screen that's, uh, to Rob's left. There, it's uh, it's interesting that it feels like during this debate too. It's the beginning of the formation of that welfare queen stereotype, hmm. um, with the whole idea about people kind of buying new cars and 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 using their money for that. And it feels like that's kind of been a, a transformative argument, I guess, for conservatives regarding a lot of these programs. Yeah, uh, yeah, absolutely. All right, so uh. I, I don't see more super chats, but another question I got about the debate itself was um, I forgot about that comment about peasants. Didn't middle aged peasants kind of have it better than 19th century laborers? I mean, in some ways, yes, in some ways, no. Uh, I, I mean, I think that um, there are respects in in which in which it was worse for sure. Um, you know, in uh, in the 19th century, I think in in terms of. Um, you know, I mean, in terms of certain kinds of dangers of industrial accidents and, you know, pollution and certain things that on feudal estates, as bad as those were, there were still certain things that were held as commons, you know, that, that were all being privatized as part of the process of creating capitalism. But I think in terms of the amount, total amount of material wealth to go around, um, you know, like, 
you know, I mean, the, the industrialization really did, you know, really, really did create that. You know, that's not wrong. You know, it's it's just that it was distributed in a horrifying way. Yeah, and it creates a new powerful overclass that dictates to us where we used to have, yeah, you know, landed gentry and aristocracy. Now we have an aristocracy of money, and yeah, it's true. Like, yeah, these are a lot poorer countries. Uh, you know, a lot, obviously, a lot less technologically developed, obviously. But yeah, like in feudalism, like you have a social place at least. And it might suck, but at least it's yours. And it's not like you're going to lose your job tomorrow and lose your house and your insurance and end up coughing under a bridge somewhere. At least that kind of um, complete immiseration was off the table. So, you know, you could, you could legitimately debate exactly what the trade off is there, but it is a, at least a mixed picture. Yeah. Yeah. No, for sure. I mean, like it's, Again, I, th I think that you have, um, and I mean, also, I mean, moving away from the, the directly, you know, material things like it is good uh, that we have, that we have a system now that where, um, you know, you are at least allowed to leave, right? You know, like, 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 like that, you know, people aren't, people aren't bound to a Lord, you know, like, like they're like literally bound to the land that they're supposed to work for their Lord, you know, by law. You know, so so it would be illegal to you know to to run off to the city, uh, even if lots of people got away, you know, did it and got away with it. Like, like that is a step in the right direction. But I think for all the reasons we talked about, it's it's certainly not good enough. Yeah, that's that's well put. All right, guys, um, you want to uh, you want to wrap it about here? All right. Uh, so uh, let me just uh, before uh, before we get off. Uh, that's true about peasants and serfs, although um, although I think my understanding is you know medieval uh, you know medieval England before the plague you know most you know most peasants are held in serfdom. But in any case, uh, there are there are definitely gradations there just to respond to something that came up in the chat. But um, uh, but in any case, yes. Yeah, so let me just uh, let me just plug some some stuff that's coming up, uh, and uh, and then we will we'll call it for the day. So um, I mentioned this at the top. Uh, but uh, the tomorrow, the second of the uh, monthly uh, Sopranos, actually, it's funny, this right in front of me. My wife gave this to me for uh, Christmas. This is the uh, Soprano sessions with uh, Matt Zoller Sites and Alan Spinewall and uh, conversation with David Chase. But uh, the second of the monthly Sopranos uh, bonus recap episodes uh, with um, uh, Nando Vila. Uh, Wozni, Big Woz, Lambre, and Mike Racine uh, is airing at uh, is premiering here at seven thirty uh, Eastern Standard, uh, and uh, going to be, uh, of course, if you're a patron, already had access to that. Uh, should uh, should say uh, if you uh, if you are able to, uh, they you know for uh, for five bucks a month um, get uh, lots of uh, lots of good stuff although the exact cocktail good stuff is shifting uh, at the beginning of January so uh, speaking of January I should say that a uh, week from today I'm uh, gonna be continuing this series uh, watching um, I'm not sure if we've decided exactly which one but uh, with philosopher professor Ryan Lake I thought I'd watch one of the uh, Sam Harris uh, debates about free will because those those are always an entertaining dumpster fire uh, man it's uh, you know, anyway, he, he has never, um, you know, he, his, his insistence on running his mouth about things that he hasn't done basic research into is almost impressive. Uh, and then uh, the day after that, the first Monday of January, we're starting up with the, uh, the new format, uh, which is that episode, instead of episodes being uh, recorded over the weekend and premiering on Monday at 7.30, uh, episodes are happening live uh, at Monday at 7.30. So uh, the first uh first monday of uh of january uh we uh the guest is going to be uh professor richard wolf uh and uh and we're starting that that new uh that new format here so it's airing live uh getting you know uh forest here uh, is going to have more on-screen role as a, as a producer uh and uh i should also say that since that does take away one of the beige uh major uh you know, patron benefits, which had been early access to everything. We're also going to start uh, in January uh, doing, um, you know, on the kind of on the Chapo model, you know, midweek, you know, doing patron exclusive uh, episodes. Uh, so uh, the first one of those is going to be a deep dive into uh, the history and politics of Kurdistan uh, with our friend Gene Bajalan. Uh, so uh, that should be uh, that should be really good stuff. 
uh lots of other things uh lots of other good things coming uh coming up but uh but yeah just you know thank you as always for everybody who for showing up uh for asking questions super chats and otherwise and uh and and watching uh and and watching this with us uh, I, actually i guess i should say since we you know we were uh we were watching william f buckley I, I think i can get away with it for like if i do like 30 seconds uh with <laughs> copyright police coming down on me uh can't uh i just want to do this real quickly Uh, would you like to sign the petition? Uh, I I don't. Uh, what, what's 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 the problem? Ah, uh, okay. Thank you. That was uh, that is the Family Guy character William F. Bottomtooth, who uh, I, I think is a not very subtle reference uh, to uh, to William F. Buckley. So um, that is uh, that is one of William F. Buckley's uh, most enduring legacies that he uh, uh, inspired that character on uh, on Family Guy, as well as unfortunately much of modern conservatism. Uh, Michael Harrington's legacy is uh, the Democratic Socialists of America. Uh, now at several tens of thousands of members and a few members of Congress. It's an imperfect organization, but I certainly know which one of those legacies I prefer. Uh, but uh, with that, I'm going to uh, gonna, uh, gonna sign off. Uh, thank you everybody for watching. Left is best. <laughs>